Just ahead on C-SPAN, a House Government Operations Subcommittee examines U.S. Border Patrol policies. On Thursday, members of the Government Information, Justice, and Agriculture Subcommittee heard testimony from federal and local officials, as well as from legal experts. The witnesses included Immigration and Naturalization Commissioner Gene McNary and Michael Williams, Chief of the U.S. Border Patrol. Here's our coverage of those proceedings from Capitol Hill. Good morning. This hearing of the Government Information, Justice, and Agriculture Subcommittee will come to order. We're here this morning to discuss the overall management procedures and pursuit policies of the Immigration and Naturalization Service and the U.S. Border Patrol. The Border Patrol's primary mission is to maintain control of the international boundaries between ports of entry by detecting and preventing the illegal entry of aliens into the United States. In accomplishing this mission, the Border Patrol inspects passengers and vehicles at checkpoints located on highways leading from border areas, at bus and rail stations, and at airports. The agency also patrols the international boundary lines, themselves in operations known as line watchers. In the past 10 years, illegal entry into this country has climbed to a truly staggering level. Apprehensions by the INS and the Border Patrol for illegal entry and narcotics smuggling have increased more than 600 percent, and conservative estimates place a number of aliens who have eluded detection since 1982 and are now illegal residents of the U.S. at more than two and a half million. In the same 10-year period, the Border Patrol has been involved in more than 3,000 pursuits along the U.S.-Mexican border. These high-speed chases have resulted in at least 35 deaths and more than 225 injuries. Clearly, must, something must be done at the agency mission and policy level. The Border Patrol has a very, very tough job, and make no mistake about it. The, the workload that's placed upon them, the uh, equipment that they're given, uh, some of it very aged, uh, the demands of the work uh, bring into focus a lot of the difficulties uh, that they have. Today's hearing is not just about the mission and policies of a federal agency. It's also about what can happen uh, when, when tragedy uh, results. It's about the frustrations of fighting against an overwhelming tide of illegal entries into this country. In short, today's hearing is about finding that balance between enforcing the law and protecting the safety and well-being of our citizens. There are some things that this hearing is not, and I want to stress that. It is not an attempt to dismantle or destroy the Border Patrol or to hamstring that agency with injurious directives. Nor is the purpose of this hearing to find guilt or innocence with regard to accidents in which the INS or Border Patrol has been involved. And it is not an attempt to gloss over the very high human toll that the high-speed pursuits take on our nation every year. What we're trying to do at this hearing is to gather facts, to take a good hard look at those policies and procedures that work and those that aren't working so well. And hopefully to find ways in which they can be improved to ensure a safe, responsible implementation of the Border Patrol's statutory mission. To help us accomplish our goal here today, we brought together a number of elected officials, policymakers, academics, law enforcement officers, and citizens to share their views and assist in bringing about change. I'm looking forward very much to the testimony of the members of Congress uh, who've also spent a lot of time on this issue and who are present today. We are pleased to have both the head of the Immigration and Nationalization Service, Commissioner Gene McNary, and the Chief of the U.S. Border Patrol, Mr. Michael Williams, with us today. We also welcome Mr. T.J. Bonner, the President of the National Border Patrol Employees Union, and Mr. Ralph Bubell of the Temecula Station, the Mayor of Temecula, California, Ms. Patricia Birdsall, Chief John Wetzel, representing the International Association of Chiefs of Police, and Dr. Jeffrey Alpert, one of the country's foremost experts on pursuit policies. I also want to acknowledge and thank very much um, my colleague and um, our ranking member, Mr. Al McCandless, who has made this a tireless effort of his 
both in pre preparation for this hearing, requesting this hearing, and the work that he has done even before the, the tragedy that uh, brought it, brings us here today. Uh, he has been a leader in visiting with Border Patrol, visiting Border Patrol facilities and bringing those um, issues of concern to the attention of this subcommittee and to others in Congress. Having said that, I uh, turn to Mr. McCandless for any opening statement he might wish to make. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your willingness to hold this hearing on Border Patrol pursuit policies. While this subcommittee has been reviewing INS management for some time and will likely hold future hearings on other matters affecting both INS and the Border Patrol, today's hearing has special significance for many of my constituents. <coughs> On June 2nd, a Border Patrol pursuit in Southern California ended in tragedy when the suspect van crashed in front of the Temecula Valley High School. Four students and one parent were lost instantly. All 12 of the van's illegal aliens were also hurt and one later died. This tragedy has shaken that community as few events could. It has drawn them close and torn them apart. It has also caused us all to pause and review both the mission we have charged the Border Patrol and the pursuit policy it has implemented in fulfilling that job. Mr. Chairman, to those who would find an instant solution in simply eliminating the Border Patrol or forbidding all pursuits, let me state clearly I do not agree. The Border Patrol has a legitimate and extremely difficult job in attempting to stem the tide of illegal immigration <coughs> flooding our borders. We cannot do without them. We can and must, however, review their operations to ensure that agency policies and procedures permit the Border Patrol to fulfill its legal duties in the safest possible manner. It is my hope that through this subcommittee we can prompt the, the reviews necessary to induce change. I will encourage a reassessment of the Border Patrol's general manner of operations, particularly those operations taking place in communities abutting our checkpoints. I will continue to encourage the ongoing review of the Border Patrol's pursuit policy. And I will encourage the creation of joint Border Patrol citizen oversight boards in each of the Border Patrol communities. Their purpose will be to begin the long process of reestablishing relations and helping to develop policies workable <coughs> for all. And finally, Mr. Chairman, I believe we must look at the Border Patrol's staffing and resource needs. While it is clear from the records of the Temecula accident that communication and vehicle replacement priorities must be reassessed, I will also ask what else needs to be done. Certainly the tightness of today's appropriation process cannot be ignored. Neither, however, can the importance of protecting our nation's borders. Therefore, I will work to secure those resources necessary for the safe and effective enforcement of our nation's boundary laws. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. McCandless, and, and for all your work in bringing this hearing uh, uh, to fruition. I now uh, uh, turn to other members of the subcommittee for any statements they might wish to make. Uh, Mr. Ross Leitman, uh, Mr. Schiff. Yes, Mr. Chairman, very briefly. First, I want to thank you for holding this hearing. This has become a matter that has come to my attention from several different directions, and I'm pleased to participate in the hearing at this time. Second, uh, Mr. Chairman, this is not the first time I've been involved directly in the issue of high-speed chase policy. As district attorney in the Albuquerque area for, for uh, eight years, that subject came up uh, in terms of our local police agencies as to when they would pursue uh, fleeing felony suspects, uh, under what conditions, who would control the chase if it occurred, and so forth. It is a very difficult issue. Uh, whenever there is a high-speed chase, there is a risk to innocent bystanders uh, of, of, of being killed, as, is, as has happened, has been illustrated by Mr. McCandless. However, it's also true that if there were a flat, um, no pursuit of anyone under any circumstance policy, and that word spread, then it's quite obvious that, uh, that individuals desiring not to be apprehended would simply flee and, and know nothing could happen to them. So it's, it's not easy to draw a line here. Uh, the approach we took in Albuquerque, as best we could, is to try to have a policy that stated uh, a not only contr a, a procedurally controlled who would control a chase if it occurred, who would be the supervisor, who would call it on, who would call it off, but try to set policies as to when it would occur. Uh, the use of a high-speed chase was considered by us to be somewhat analogous to the use of deadly force because of the uh, ability of, of innocent bystanders to be killed in the process. Uh, in this particular situation, uh, I, of course, want to wait and hear the testimony of the uh, Border Patrol, 
But uh, my general view is such a balance might be approached here. Uh, if, uh, if in a circumstance uh, some individuals who are uh, illegal immigrants uh, might not be apprehended, I think that has to be looked at the context of what does that add to the total number of illegal immigrants who are already into the country. Uh, at the same time, if, if individuals suspected of uh, greater offense um, might, might uh, escape, escape to freedom, then there may be more of a need for a high-speed chase. So that would be the dire direction I, I'm looking for, but look forward to hearing the witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. The subcommittee is very pleased to have as its first panel three members of Congress who have spent uh, time on this issue themselves and their own uh, individual situations. I would delight to have them join us. Uh, we'll start, why don't we just start in the order that each is listed. Uh, uh, Congressman Byron Dorgan from North Dakota, Congressman Duncan Hunter from California, and Congressman Ron Packard from California. Uh, Byron, why don't you open it up? Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, your holding these <coughs> hearings today. Uh, as Mr. McCandless said, the, the, one of the issues here is the Border Patrol, but not just the Border Patrol. The, the issue here is much larger and much broader than that. And I know that you have representatives testifying today from the uh, Chiefs of Police and others in the law enforcement community. I expect uh, people will testify from uh, groups formed for victims of uh, this tragedy. And I hope that, uh, that you will make some recommendations from this set of hearings to the Congress because I think that uh, we do need some policy in this area and I'd like to explain briefly what I mean by that. We know from what reports exist that somewhere around 300 people a year are killed in this country as a result of high-speed chases. We know that it is much more than that because we don't have all of the states reporting and we don't have assurance that those states that do report are reporting all of the things that are happening. But we do know 300 people are killed, uh, probably much, much more. Um, the injuries and death that result from high-speed chases, in a good many cases, I think can be avoided. Now, my family uh, has uh, suffered from this issue, as have many across this country. My mother was killed in a high-speed chase some years ago. And I know when we talk about the issue, we talk about statistics, how many killed, how many injured, what states have which laws. Uh, my mother is probably, uh, was probably a fairly typical case, four blocks from home, driving 25 miles an hour, coming back from visiting someone in the hospital. She was hit by a drunk driving 80 miles an hour on a city street. This was a drunk who was uh, being chased by the police for fishtailing his pickup truck on Main Street. Ensued then was a chase in the city of 80 miles an hour, according to witnesses, and my mother's car was struck and she was killed instantly. The point is that she, like hundreds of others across this country every year, are innocent victims on the streets of America of high-speed chases. And I've got to tell you that I was angry at the police when it happened. I was angrier at the person that was fleeing the police. But I've come to understand that, that the law enforcement officers here are not the villains. The people who flee from law enforcement officers trying to apprehend them are the villains. There are some problems in law enforcement, however, that we must address. And what I have suggested in legislation I've introduced here in Congress is two things. One dealing with a message to those that flee the police or law enforcement authorities, and the other dealing with law enforcement authorities themselves. I'd like the Congress to say to the states, we want uniform laws across this country that say two things. One, if you are attempting to be apprehended by law enforcement officers, if a law enforcement officer is attempting to apprehend you and you flee, you should know there are two things that are certain. That flight means you're going to lose your automobile, they're going to seize it and keep it, and number two, you're going to sit in jail. There ought to be certain jail time and forfeiture of your automobile if you decide to flee from the ap potential apprehension of, uh, or attempted apprehension of law enforcement officers. That's what I want people in this country to know before they decide to run from the police. Second, I want the law enforcement authorities to know a couple of things. I want them to know that we in this country expect, if we're driving down the street in Oklahoma or California or North Dakota, that there are people on the street in the law enforcement community who have been trained in pursuit policy, 
and who are following a policy that's been established in their law enforcement unit. We should expect uniform training and uniform policies. A couple of weeks ago, I talked to a county sheriff in Minot, North Dakota, about my bill. And he said, it's interesting you called me, Congressman. He said, last night, we had a case where there was a drunk, very drunk, driving on the streets, and the law enforcement officer attempted to apprehend him, and he took off in a high-speed flight. This drunk had two young children in the car, driving very erratically, and took off at an extraordinarily high rate of speed. And the county sheriff said, we decided immediately not to chase. We had ID'd the vehicle, we knew who it was, and we felt to embark on a high-speed chase would probably result in the death of those two children in the car. The result was, several hours later, we arrested the driver. The children didn't die, there wasn't an accident, no one was killed. That's the way pursuit policies ought to work. You ought to have policies and training and they ought to be informed and you ought to have judgments made that are appropriate judgments by people in the law enforcement community. So, I, I'm very delighted that you're holding these hearings. I, I have introduced <coughs> legislation in Congress, but I have not um, had the capability or had the, the venue that you have to move this forward on this kind of committee. And I know that the tragedy, that the terrible tragedy that occurred in California, I read the accounts just broke my heart because it uh, brought back a lot of awful memories from my family. But it, it's not just the California tragedy, it's going on weekly in this country. That happened because you had so many casualties, it was headlines. But I'm telling you that today someplace, somebody's going to have a busted taillight, and somebody out there in law enforcement is going to embark on a chase, and they're going to be going 80 miles an hour someplace, and some young kid or some, uh, some lady's going to be driving someplace, and she's going to be killed. And it needn't happen if we have the right kind of policies, and if we send the right signals to people in this country about the penalties for fleeing from the law enforcement people. So. Let me, Mr. Chairman, uh, commend my legislation to you and hope that you on this subcommittee will take a close look at it. And uh, let me again thank you for uh, the sensitivity that you have to hold these hearings on a matter that's very important to me and I think to many others. Thank you, and thank you for a very moving statement. Um, Mr. Hunter. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and uh, members of the committee appreciate the chance to, to, uh, to talk to you and, and also to listen uh, to my colleague, Mr. Dorgan. Uh, I wanted to paint for you as, as a representative who represents the, the entire uh, California-Mexican uh, border and is, am able to watch on a, on a daily basis uh, what happens there with respect to, uh, to the immigration policies of this nation and, and drug interdiction policies. I'd like to paint a picture uh, for you as to what, uh, what happens uh, from the border north, uh, that, that hundred or so miles up to the Temecula area where this uh, tragedy occurred with this high-speed chase. Now, first, let me say, Mr. Chairman, that the uh, in the Border Patrol we have a, a a small group of personnel who confront on a daily basis an absolute army uh, of smugglers, uh, people who are smuggling both uh, both uh, illegal aliens into this country and narcotics, uh, narcotics on an increasing scale. And so, what you have is is a total. Uh, uh, nationwide of about 3,973 agents, about 1,200 of them in California, and most of those uh, on the Mexican border. And what they see is what you will see if you go to, to uh, San Diego or to other places and you go out at night as, it, as the sun starts to go down, you will see battalions of, uh, of immigrants, illegal immigrants, forming on the other side of the border at, at such famous places as the so-called soccer field in Tijuana. Uh, and you will watch them being formed in a military manner uh, with the coyotes or the smugglers organizing them. And then as the sun goes down uh, and, you, and you look through a night scope, you will see them start to fan out in their squads and platoons uh, for entrance into the, into the United States. Now at the same time, uh, you will see, especially if you're there during the daytime, drive-through attempts. And that's where you'll, you will have personnel drive across the border in trucks or cars uh, at high speed, uh, and not at ports of entry, but just right across the hills or across the mesas in an attempt to break into the, uh, into the freeway system and get lost in the crowd uh, in, uh, in that grand central station atmosphere that attends the border or in the major freeway arteries, 805 or Highway 5, that come down and touch the Mexican border. Now let me tell you one thing that we've done uh, in the border in San Diego. 
Uh, we have built now a 12-mile fence. We're going to build a 14-mile fence across the entire smuggler's corridor, what we call a smuggler's corridor, between San Diego and Tijuana. A couple of years ago, we had as many as 350 drive throughs a month. These are people driving vehicles through at high rates of speed, heading north toward the Temecula area. And as a result of this, uh, we searched around the world for landing mat, uh, found some 179,000 pieces, and employed the, uh, the Army Reserve under our drug interdiction program to start building a steel wall, a steel fence between San Diego and Tijuana. We've now built 12 miles of that 14-mile fence. The Otay Mesa area, where we have had up in the past some 350 drive-throughs, uh, high-speed drive-throughs a month, is now totally sealed off. A couple of people tried to ram the fence. Uh, their cars were, were bent up and broken up, but they were not able to damage the fence or to punch a hole in it. So to some degree, we've at least with this fence, we've mitigated some of the problem, and, and that relates to the, to the situation where trucks and cars just drive directly through the fence or, or through the border from Mexico and then head north. Now let me just tell you, I think the problem here uh, is a big problem, and it's a problem that goes far beyond the policy uh, with respect to high-speed chases. The reason we have a Border Patrol uh, operation at Highway 15 near Temecula, and the reason we have one at Highway 5 is because the Border Patrol realized some years ago that they were a small group being overwhelmed by a very large army. And they did what most armies do when that occurs. They abandoned to some degree the perimeter, that is the border, between the U.S. and Mexico because they didn't have enough people. And they had to develop fallback positions. And those include the checkpoints at Highway 15 and Highway 5 where they could, could, could uh, make apprehensions when, when uh, those that are being smuggled, both illegal aliens and narcotics, go, through, go up through these two arteries, that's Highway 15 and Highway 5, up into the populated areas in Northern California. The fact that we have to have uh, border checkpoints in the interior is a reflection of the fact that we have not dedicated enough personnel and enough resources to stopping illegal immigration and illegal narcotic smuggling at the border. And, and I just want to tell you what the statistics are for the first uh, uh, five months of this year with respect to narcotics. Since we built this fence and we've started to, to uh, try to reestablish the integrity of the border itself, cocaine seizures have gone up a thousand percent over the entire of last year. We've interdicted now over 6,000 pounds of cocaine. We interdicted only about 690 pounds in the entire of last year. That means that in reestablishing the border and using the National Guard and the Army Reserve to build this fence uh, and to start to, to try to, uh, to reestablish the integrity of that border, we in fact are, are interdicting now and deterring people from crossing. Now the other problem that we have is simply this. When people come across the border because we have such a small force of people, they're virtually guaranteed entrance into the United States and transportation up into the interior, including the areas around Temecula, Riverside County, and points north. Uh, when we take people back and, and we, we do apprehend them and take them back and put them back in Mexico, we just turn them slightly just, just right across that boundary line, and in some cases you will have stories of people being back on the job the next day after being apprehended. In the old days, we used to have a policy of deep interdiction, and that meant if we, if we apprehended somebody on the border, we took them in ships to a far point south where it took them several, when we'd turn them back to Mexico, uh, a thousand miles or so below the border, where it took a considerable effort to get back up uh, and if they wanted to make a second attempt to come into the United States. I would suggest that we need to reestablish our policy uh, of, of deep repatriation. Otherwise, we are, are using up our resources, which are very meager, in what amounts to a turnstile of people going, uh, going north, being shipped south, and going north the next day. That's the problem, that, res or that is the picture that I wanted to paint for you that has resulted in this tragedy that occurred some hundred miles or so uh, north of the international border. We should have the resources and the personnel and the equipment to, in fact, hold that border and if we do that, we won't have to uh, rely on this fallback strategy of having, having Border Patrol establishments up the full length of California uh, with the resulting uh, uh, tragedy that comes about when you have this interaction with the Border Patrol and, and, uh, and uh, illegal immigrants who are fleeing like you did in the high-speed chase at Temecula. So we need more people. We need more resources. We need to reestablish the integrity of the California border. And that will help to solve this problem. 
and I have, I have great uh, 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 empathy with, with, with Mr. Dorgan's remarks. The problem is that no matter how good our policies are with respect to high-speed chases, there's no way you can render a high-speed chase safe. High-speed chases are necessary because if you don't have them, uh, then you're going to have basically a situation in which people can, can be illegally smuggled or narcotics can be illegally smuggled uh, without fear of, uh, of apprehension. So you have to, in some cases, have high-speed chases. And the way to obviate that problem and eliminate that problem is to deter people from coming across the international border, whether it's illegal immigrants uh, or people who are bringing narcotics. Thank you. Thank I'd, you, I'd like to ask that my whole statement, uh, my written statement, you're, you're be part of everyone, it. And I'll just make that statement so that everyone understands he'll testify subsequently. Uh, all written statements are automatically made a part of the uh, record. So, thank you. Um, uh, another member who has a district, as I recall, on the border and, and who spends a lot of time on these issues, uh, uh, Representative Packard. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank you for allowing us to testify before your subcommittee. I also want to commend my colleague from California, Mr. McCandless, who has continually addressed this problem. He struggles with the issue as much, perhaps, as I do. We have uh, districts that are affected <coughs> greatly by the, our immigration policy and our immigration problems. Uh, before beginning my testimony, I'd like to ask unanimous consent, if I may, that to have uh, entered or have the record, uh, the hearing record remain open for 30 days. I have asked for a report that is being prepared by Senator Craven, who is representing at the state level um, San, part of San Diego County. He is preparing uh, and having prepared a rather um, uh, inclusive um, uh, report on the fiscal and the name of the uh, the report will be the uh, the fiscal impact analysis of undocumented migrants uh, immigrants residing in San Diego County. We think this would be a valuable asset to the testimony, and we've tried to get it, but it's not available quite yet. It will be shortly. Uh, so, with that uh, request for a we're we're just uh, thinking about timing. Uh, without objection, uh, we'll we'll leave the record open that way. Thank long. you. I, we'll submit it as soon as it's available. Yeah. That, yeah the, the only thought we the only concern I had, Ron, was um, uh, whether or not we want to try and get a report out uh, sometime in September. So that, as soon as it comes in, we'll put it in the record. Then we'll move. From we there. think it'll be available to us uh, by August the fifth or sixth, maybe Fine. the seventh. And Fine. as soon as it's available, it'll be made available to the committee. Good. Thank you. Illegal immigration is illegal. It's against the law. However, the important facts does not seem to have a significant impact upon illegals' uh, behavior. They will still do almost anything to enter this country. I will not suggest that Congress can alter this behavior. Instead, I submit that it is our obligation to enforce the law and to alter current policy, which is clearly ineffective. I come before the subcommittee today on behalf of my convictions and my constituents. Both inform me that the current situation is unacceptable and I'm determined to try to find ways to change it. The severe economic impact illegals inflict upon the citizens of this country is a travesty. Illegal immigrants are breaking the law. In lieu of reforming immigration laws, Congress is, re Congress is responsible for providing the funds necessary to enforce current law and act on behalf of the tax-paying, law-abiding citizens. Without question, my district is one of the hardest hit by overwhelming infiltration of illegal migrants. Because Southern Californians live in a high-traffic immigration corridor, we pay a heavy price. Because we are unable to adequately secure our borders, millions of undocumented aliens cross into Southern California every year. The INS estimates that over one million illegals were caught and deported last year. However, they also estimate for every illegal caught, three to four made it through the border undetected. That gives you a feel for the scope of the problem, and most of them, at least in Southern California, flow through my district. Every single illegal that crosses the border costs our taxpayers money. Why? Because once illegals arrive, federal law mandates that they be provided with medical care, schooling, and other social ser services. And yet the federal government does not provide the funds necessary to furnish such services, leaving it instead to local communities. 
Now, I understand money is tight, both here and in our states and certainly in our local communities. Federal dollars are scarce, and I'm, I'm sure it is not a news flash to this members of this subcommittee that we simply do not have adequate funds to address all the problems that we face. But let me underscore, the minute illegal aliens make it across the border, they cost every taxpayer considerable amount of money. It is cheaper in the long run to provide funds to keep, keep illegals out because once they get here, costs skyrocket. It, uh, the fact is, illegal immigration inflicts a huge economic burden on citizens. Those who break the law entering this country are rewarded with a whole menu of services and benefits paid for by the taxpayers. Health care, education, housing assistance, welfare benefits. Illegal migration jeopardizes public safety. From 1990 through, 19, uh, through June 21, 1992, the San Diego sector of the Border Patrol conducted 3,664 pursuits. 20, 121 of these pursuits resulted in accidents. And in those 121 accidents, 44 people were injured and 12 were killed. It is an unacceptable loss of life, not to mention the cost of treating those who are injured uh, and the damage done to property. And many of those injured, including the illegal migrants, end up in our hospitals, and the hospitals sustain the cost because they are not paid. Finally, illegal migration threatens the integrity of our communities and the way of life. In California, uh, if we continue to operate without, uh, or we now are continuing to operate without a state budget, there are working families who are unable to cash their paychecks in California, and yet we continue to house, educate, and provide health care for people who are here illegally. An increasing share of the state budget is eaten up by providing benefits to illegals. I believe the American taxpayer should not work simply to reward those who have broken the law. The recent tragedy in, in Temecula highlights the fact that illegal immigration <coughs> has reached crisis proportions. It underscores the fact that current intervention techniques at the border are inadequate. High-speed pursuit emanating from our checkpoints are hazardous to our citizens. And immediate action is needed to stop illegal migration. It's incumbent upon the Congress to act now. I met with the Border Patrol uh, at one of the checkpoints just uh, very recently. Uh, and the meeting with them uh, expressed to me, they expressed to me the frustration they have. They are doing uh, what they consider their mandated responsibilities. They're following the rules, the procedures, and the policies uh, that we've laid down. And they're as frustrated as the community people and uh, the citizens are. Uh, they're hardworking people, and they're dedicated to their job, and they're doing a good job. And yet when an accident or a tragedy like this happens, they find themselves caught in the middle of a situation that they become branded and, and, and often uh, are, are penalized. Uh, my heart goes out to them because they are working under rather difficult conditions too, not having adequate <coughs> funds, adequate uh, personnel, adequate equipment, and, um, and certainly having to deal with policy and problems that are beyond their scope. It is not my intention to come before this subcommittee and demean the job performance of our Border Patrol or the INS. I only want to scrutinize the agency's policies, which may, be, which may not be effective or safe. The men and women in the INS and Border Patrol do an outstanding job with meager resources and overworked personnel due to staffing shortages. My goal today is to, and I think it's the goal of this subcommittee, to examine the mission of the agency and the agency's pursuit policy in terms of effectiveness and consequence. Because there are two inland checkpoints in my district, it is of, of special concern to my constituents that the legitimate needs to apprehend illegals is balanced with their safety. While I support these checkpoints as a second line of defense, and I do, against um, illegal migration, they have been continuous lightning rods for controversy. The checkpoints operate intermittently due to traffic congestion and a shortage of personnel. <coughs> Illegals lie waiting for the checkpoints to close and then drive through. It's an effect, it, it is, is this an effective policy? Certainly not in the minds of many of my constituents who are uh, greatly um, 
inconvenienced on a daily basis, many of them, by having to wait in line and go through the checkpoints. The Border Patrol's pursuit policy is a double-edged sword. Apprehending and deporting suspected illegal aliens is necessary. However, citizen safety must not be compromised. The checkpoints are the originating spot for many high-speed chases, which endanger the citizens in surrounding communities and jeopardize the lives of the Border Patrol agents themselves. Therefore, I have conducted, and I believe the subcommittee will concur, uh, or con I have concluded rather, and I believe the, the subcommittee will concur, uh, in order for the checkpoints to be effective, some sort of physical barrier must be installed at these checkpoints to decrease the possibility of high-speed chases actually occurring. Congress has been dragging its feet on this issue. Uh, let me give you an example. In, uh, or the INS estimates that it will take 10 years for Congress to fund and redesign the checkpoint at I-5. We have already funded $10 million to st and we've already begun the design work on the checkpoint at I-5. And uh, now we've learned that it, they expect it'll take 10 years to go through the environmental reports and to ultimately build the facility. Uh, that simply is not acceptable. I can't understand and cannot believe that it would take 10 years to um, uh, especially when we've already begun the work. Uh, ten years is too long, and, and I personally consider the, per the, the current crisis that we face uh, cannot wait ten years. The checkpoints must, must be redesigned so that the Border Patrol has effective means of apprehending illegals. This means installing barriers so that illegals cannot flee and cause accidents. However, in current plans to make improvements to the checkpoints, the installation of physical barriers is not being considered. In the current design on I-5, on I it does not include barriers that will literally prevent them from initiating a high-speed uh, chase. Pouring money into these checkpoints will not solve the problem. We need to fund improvements in a timely manner and that will improve or will prove to be effective physical barriers to prevent high-speed chases. Um, uh, and it's a necessary component of the second line of defense against illegal entry. The lack of an effective means of apprehension at the checkpoints is costing lives. The Border Patrol agents are not the only ones who must be on guard. Motorists must watch out for illegals who hide by the side of highways or in the median strip and then streak across the freeway to avoid apprehension. Since 1989, 120 illegals have been killed by northbound motorists on I-5. You can imagine how you would feel if you were the driver of one of those motorists, or mo mo one of those cars. Recently, the family of an illegal alien killed while trying to run across I-5 filed suit against the driver of the car. A citizen is being sued by an illegal's family who readily admits that he was breaking the law but insists the driver should share responsibility. It has become a physical and legal ob obstacle course to drive down I-5 and I-15, and I do this every day, and sometimes several times a day, and go through these checkpoints as I service my district. I requested uh, this hearing because I have, have another agenda, to focus my colleagues' attention on this crisis. Uh, we have tried, uh, Mr. McCandless has certainly been a part of this effort, tried to inform our colleagues of the nature of the problem we struggle with. Uh, we simply have not been able to get the attention of the Congress. The Temecula tragedy underscores two unmistakable facts. The illegal immigration is a cri that Ill illegal immigration is a crisis, and two, Congress has not held up to its end of the bargain. It must commit the improvement of border defenses and enforcement of the 1986 IRCA laws. This means funding. Anything less is a breach of public trust. We included funds, $4 billion in the, in, in the IRCA bill for the very purpose of funding the needs of implementing that bill. And since the enactment of the Immigration Reform Act uh, and Control Act or the IRCA bill of 1986, state and local governments have been forced to shoulder the burden, meaning the financial burden of federal policy, policy over which they have no control. State and local governments have been devastated by health care and educational costs uh, which they are required to provide by federal law. Uh, an example of Congress refusing to shoulder its share of the impact of illegal migration, the Appropriations Bill for Labor Education, HHS, uh, for fiscal year 1993 cuts in half the total $1.2 billion in SLEAG funding. Once again, Congress is trying to delay funding the federal mandates it forces upon states and local government. 
And yet another example, this week, we considered the Commerce, State, and Justice Appropriations Bill. The Senate Authorizing Committee had obligated money um, for an additional 200 Border Patrol agents. Yet, in the Appropriations Bill, the Senate cut the funding for, for the 200 Border Patrol agents. And it is the ty this is the type of schizophrenic policy that is causing our border to leak like a sieve. Congress promises and then won't produce the necessary money. How can we hold the Border Patrol accountable when they are dependent upon Congress for the funding? Until Congress is willing to fund the enforcement effort of the INS, IRCA remains a relatively ineffective law. Worse, it has become an avenue for illegal aliens to obtain the benefits of health care, education, and housing assistance that our own citizens are ineligible to receive. This affects every taxpayer nationwide. Without question, my congressional district is one of the hardest hit by illegal migration. That does not mean that the situation that exists in my district in Southern California is somehow regional or local and, uh, and unique. Residents of my, of my district may suffer disproportionately, but Ill illegal migration affects everyone. It is a national concern, and I want to make this perfectly clear. Further inattention to this matter will only exacerbate nationally what is occurring in California. Washington's ongoing indifference to the problem of illegal immigration is the real villain in the Temecula incident. The tragedy is that illegal my immigration is costing innocent people their lives. In the 10, in the ten years that I have served as a member of, of this body, the most frustrating part of my job has been trying to convince Congress that illegal, illegal immigration is an issue that deserves national attention because it affects us all. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. McCandless, any questions? I have no questions, Chairman. Mr. Schiff? Um, just one question for our colleague, uh, Congressman Hunter. The fence that you're describing, um, uh, I wonder if you just tell me a little bit more. Uh, how, how many miles is this fence intended to cover? Well, this, uh, the, the, what, what I call the smuggler's corridor, that is where over 50 percent of the, of the illegal aliens and narcotics smuggled into the United States, comes through the 15-mile corridor between the Pacific Ocean, along the international border between the Pacific Ocean and what is known as, as uh, Otay Mesa, which is essentially the start of the coastal mountain range. It's about a 15, about a 14 mile wide corridor. Now interestingly, uh, beyond that, if you go east of that, you have rough mountains and desert, which is very difficult to smuggle either people or narcotics through. Uh, we, so we intend to cover the full 14 miles of this, uh, of this uh, uh, border with this fence, and we've got about 12 miles completed as of right now. That's what I was getting at. Would covering only 14 miles make a, make a significant impact in your it, judgment? Let me just say, it's, since we've built this fence, we have increased narcotics interdiction a thousand percent in the first five months of this year. We have inter uh, increased narcotics interdiction a thousand percent over the entire of last year, and indeed our our, uh, our alien interdictions have gone up markedly too. We've cut down assaults on on border patrol officers by close to fifty percent. That is, rocks into the windshields, assault, bodily assaults, gunshots, and that type of thing. So it separated the lawless element uh, on the other side. But the point is, the fence, the full effect of the fence, will not be felt until, like any fence, until it's completed. And when we get that, we still have major gaps in the fence at Smugglers Canyon and Goat Canyon, where large armies of illegal aliens still come through at nighttime, and, and the famous soccer field at Spring, uh, Spring Canyon. We are within a couple of, mi of months of sealing up those canyons. And we have another, a couple other things that I think Gus De Lavina would like to talk about. And, and just on that point, Mr. Schiff, I just wanted to say, uh, since I didn't say it earlier, that under the leadership in the San Diego sector of Gus De Lavina, who is here today, our sector chief, uh, and under Mr. McNary's leadership of INS, the Border Patrol has never been more effective in being able to, to, to uh, uh, work under these incredibly difficult conditions with this very, very small force of people. I think that, that what Mr. Packard has said uh, uh, reiterates once again the fact that the, the place to spend the dollars to be cost effective is at the border. We spend $15.3 billion a year uh, servicing illegal aliens with respect to social services and also those that we send back, arresting, transporting, feeding, and taking care of. 
It's much cheaper to deter somebody from coming across than it is to service them once they get across. And most of the dollars that we spend now with INS, unfortunately, because we're overwhelmed, are spent servicing them. But I think that this border fence is going to be highly effective. It already is, and, and Mr. De La Vena will tell you more about that. Okay. I have no further questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A very active member of our subcommittee who's, who's joined us, uh, Mr. Condit. I want to thank uh, the panel for taking the time and bringing your, your experience and particular insights uh, to the subcommittee. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chairman. Let, let me also congratulate Mr. McCandless again for helping to, to uh, put this thing together and for all the efforts that he's undertaken. Uh, he's very much been a, a part of this, the solution to this problem. I can well testify to that. Um, our next uh, panel will be Commissioner of uh, the Immigration Naturalization Service, Gene McNary, uh, and Michael Williams, Chief of the U.S. Border Patrol. Gentlemen, it's a practice of the subcommittee so as not to prejudice any witnesses who ever may appear before it to swear in all witnesses. Do you have any objection if you'd stand and raise your right hand? You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Commissioner McNary, Chief Williams, your written statements in their entirety are already made a part of the record, so I'd invite you to summarize in any way you wish. Uh, perhaps there's some points you'd like to touch upon that have been raised in preceding testimony or other points you'd like to bring up. Uh, Commissioner? Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I'd like to uh, summarize, but uh, I tend to make some points here that I think are relevant to the purpose of uh, this hearing. <coughs> Just 57 days ago, on June 2nd, the city of Temecula and the Border Patrol experienced a shattering event that cost the lives of six people. I've said before that this accident was a terrible tragedy, and I and the Border Patrol officers in Washington and in California and throughout the nation extend our deepest sympathy to the families and friends of those who died. It's especially tragic when the lives of innocent people are lost. It's devastating to the community and to the people who reside there. And incidentally, there are 81 Border Patrol personnel who reside in Temecula. The INS and its Border Patrol are no exception. Some Border Patrol agents suffered severe depression and despair because of the accident. Several received counseling as a result of their emotional condition. I'm here today along with the Chief of the Border Patrol, Mike Williams, to my right, and other concerned leadership of this proud organization for the same reason that you, as members of Congress, Temecula officials, and survivors of those who lost their lives are here to try to ensure that such an incident never happens again, or at least that we can reduce the possibility of it happening again. Despite some reports to the contrary, the Border Patrol acted responsibly in reacting to this event and has been responsive to the needs of the community. Officers have met with Temecula city officials and the healing of a deep wound has begun. This should come as no surprise for the Border Patrol is comprised of decent and caring persons, all Spanish speaking, 40% of whom are of Hispanic descent. They're all well trained to do their very demanding job and taught to exercise the patience humanitarian concern and sensitivity to deal with hundreds of thousands of persons who attempt to charge past them, usually looking for a better life. Those who allege that these agents are wild and reckless are badly mistaken. However, the personal risks are part of the agent's job and the overall benefit to the public must be weighed against the dangers of enforcing the law. The immediate reaction to the Temecular tragedy, which is only natural, was to place blame and punish the culprits. In this case, the Border Patrol was seen as a ready target. That blame was misplaced, however. The Border Patrol officers were per performing their sworn duty, which is to apprehend illegal aliens and alien smugglers. That's their duty. The pursuit was terminated. The pursuit was terminated before the accident and any law enforcement agency which observed the reckless and maniacal driving of the smuggler's van would have given chase. Despite those facts, 
The Border Patrol was declared accountable by the news media and others. Immediately following the accident, I dispatched the Director of Internal Audit from INS to investigate and determine the facts and to meet with police officials. That report has been released, and the conclusion was that the Border Patrol agents acted responsibly following existing policy and were not at fault. Some observers has, have alleged that the policy must be wrong and recommended that we abandon all pursuits. We've had in progress at INS a revision of several of our policies, including the General Arrest Authority, Firearms, and Pursuit. These changes will clarify and update operations in these areas consistent with the expanded mission assigned to the INS under the Immig Immigration Act, <coughs> Act of 1990. The pursuit policy, however, was not the problem here. It was revised as recently as 1987 and was followed by the Border Patrol. It is very much like other enforcement agencies' pursuit policies. Recently, we revised the high-speed, high-risk portion of the pursuit policy to fine-tune the handling of high-speed pursuits. That policy has been made public and is available and is a, a major change in the handling of high-speed pursuits. However, I should point out that the new policy may not have prevented the accident at Temecula. The accident did not occur because of the policy. It took place because of the disregard for human life on the part of the smugglers. INS has taken steps that will considerably lower the risk to the public by tightening our policy on pursuits that will limit them to only those situations where the suspect clearly presents an imminent danger. However, we can only control what our officers do. We have no control over the suspect who may flee at high speeds, merely at the sight of a Border Patrol officer or vehicle, even when no pursuit is initiated. This new policy, which will eliminate most high-speed pursuits, should not be construed as an abandonment of our responsibility to apprehend illegal aliens and smugglers. Rather, we will use alternate methods to apprehend the suspects, aircraft when available, lookouts for the vehicle and its occupants to be broadcast widely to INS and other law enforcement agencies, methods that will not pose the danger to the public entailed in a high-speed pursuit. <coughs> now, there's another element in this situation, the support of some dedicated Americans who serve in the Border Patrol. The Border Patrol agents are responsible for stopping the influx of thousands of persons who would enter the country illegally. Nearly half a million are apprehended attempting entry, and you've already heard this from the various congressmen, a half a million attempt entry every year, or apprehended every year in a 12-mile stretch between San Diego and Tijuana. <clears throat> Our agents are supposed to be professional and sensitive, and they are. At the same time, they face those who would murder, rape, rob, assault, and smuggle drugs and people. More Border Patrol agents have been killed than any other group of federal law enforcement agents. Most people don't realize that. Every day they're required to be part diplomat, a major problem that this committee, I hope, will address. Nobody stands behind the, the Border Patrol in international relations. We all have to tiptoe and be careful about what we say they have to be part diplomat, part lawyer, part enforcement officer, always relying on the knowledge that they can only do their best. They take risks, they ask, act instinctively based on their training, and yet there are very few complaints in proportion to the hundreds of thousands of apprehensions. One complaint in 17,000 apprehensions. We should not allow the tragedy of Temecula to divert attention from the national problem of mass illegal immigration, which you've heard, and, and so properly so, already. Rather, this incident gives us even greater reasons to focus on what has become a travesty of the law. 3,000 people every day are apprehended coming across the southern border. Those are the ones we apprehend. And while we send the Border Patrol out to somehow deal with this mass illegal immigration, we read charges from special interest groups 
about how the Border Patrol is vicious and brutal. Such statements are made by these groups which resist anything that would assist the Border Patrol to stop illegal migration. Only during the past two years the border, was the border fence reinforced, lights installed, sensors enhanced to assist the Border Patrol, and even these routine and minimal improvements <coughs> met with resistance from the special interests. You've heard from them, you read about them, they're, they're well-spoken, highly quoted, and given great newspaper support. My point is this, we cannot expect to control immigration to control immigration if, after spending years fine-tuning an immigration policy that focuses on family unification, employment needs, and the social and cultural objectives of this nation, we then refuse to provide full support for those laws and policies. The insult to our laws is compounded when lower levels of government embrace policies at odds with the federal law. We stretch credibility if we expect a small core of underpaid and underappreciated American men and women to risk their lives on the border, stopping the masses of people who repeatedly attempt to run past them. A further obstacle working against the Border Patrol officers is the fact that they often encounter great reluctance by local communities to cooperate in any way uh, in the enforcement of immigration laws. Our officers have been turned down on numerous occasions when they have requested assistance, turned down by other law enforcement agencies. Some cities have gone so far as to issue specific instructions that their police will not assist INS. Among these cities are Chicago, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and a number of smaller cities. Add to this fact that some cities in California actually encourage unlawful immigration by providing welfare, housing, education, and health services to persons here illegally and require that records of such assistance be kept confidential from the INS. Confidential. A law passed by Congress, the law of the land, illegal people taking advantage of benefits they're not entitled to, and yet INS, charged with doing the job, is not supposed to be advised. We have not had the local cooperation because of political pressures exerted by the special interest groups that I mentioned, whose goal is to weaken immigration law enforcement to the point that it's totally ineffective. Now, if in the future we're to have effective immigration control and avoid the mayhem and vehicle accidents that are caused by fleeing felons and smugglers of drugs and aliens, we need the cooperation and assistance of state and local communities and their law enforcement entities. The new INS pursuit policy depends on the cooperation of other police departments. Without it, a coordinated radio network, law file, without a coordinated radio network, the law violators uh, may escape simply by refusing to stop and take evasive action. Pursuit is essential. Enforcement is essential to the law. If we intend to stand behind it, pursuit is essential to enforcement. Checkpoints also seem to be at issue. This year, Temecula and San Clemente have accounted for 327, this is this year, 327 drug seizures amounting to more than 27 million in street value. And last year, they apprehended 1,700 illegal aliens every week who were on their way to Los Angeles to further overload that city with illegal aliens. These checkpoints, which Congress has determined should be expanded, not eliminated, serve as a backup to border enforcement. <coughs> it is time that this nation, the people of California, and all the people of America regain their focus. We face serious problems when the Border Patrol is maligned for doing its job, when special interest groups use the friendly ear of the media to bash the Border Patrol with generalities and misrepresentations, and when aliens are encouraged to violate our laws. Border Patrol and immigration agents enforce the laws of this nation. They deserve our support, not our scorn. I'm, I have here with me today Border Patrol agents who have dedicated their lives to the service of this nation. Several of them are Chief Patrol agents who manage our 22 border sectors. You can tell who they are, they're in uniform. I'm here as one American to tell you that I'm proud of them 
And I pray that one day we will see the federal government, the state of California, and all Americans stand behind them and not only support their efforts to do the job that we have assigned them, but also to applaud them for their patriotism. Millions of the world's people want to come to this nation. My judgment is a billion would like to come here for mostly economic reasons, for, but for many other. People want to come here because we're a highly de developed civilization. Basic to our progress has been that we are a nation of laws. We must stand behind those who give our laws meaning and enforce them at some risk to their own safety at some risk to their own safety. We've had border patrols or risk, border patrolmen who risked their lives to at one point qualified for food stamps in San Diego. We understand, and I want to underscore this, we understand the grief of the families here today who lost loved ones for we share that grief. We also understand the desire of Congress to examine this incident and to seek assurance that there will be no reoccurrence for we also share that desire. The Temecula tragedy is but one sad result of an ill that will continue to plague the nation as long as uncontrolled masses of people enter along the Southern California border. The real solution is control of illegal immigration, a commitment and a determination to prevent large numbers of illicit border crossings backed up with resources to accomplish that goal. I ask for your understanding of the immensity of the problem that the Border Patrol in our country faces and for the support of this committee, the entire Congress, and the American people in our effort to carry out the law enforcement mission which we have been assigned. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Commissioner uh, McNary. Uh, Chief Williams, do you have any statement? I turn to Mr. McCandless for his round of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before we continue with the uh, questions, I would like unanimous consent to enter in the record uh, various material which has been submitted by people uh, who are involved in this who are unable to attend or unable to testify as a part of the record. Without objection, it shall be entered. Thank you. In, in keeping with uh, one of my policies, I'm going to yield uh, the first questioning round to uh, Mr. Schiff. Mr. Schiff. <coughs> I thank the gentleman for yielding and thank both witnesses for being here today. Uh, Mr. McNary, um, I'd like to ask, since it is obvious that the, uh, the uh, tragedy at Temecula has in part brought us here today, um, in your judgment, did the Border Patrol do anything or fail to do anything uh, that you would believe should have been done otherwise? In no, that incident. Sir. Uh, and I immediately dispatched an investigator to, to determine what the facts were. In this particular situation, and the, and the reason that it's hard to relate this situation to a pursuit policy, is that at the time of the accident, there was no chase. I want to focus on one particular time, which was only five minutes or so before the accident. But there had been a chase. Before then, had there not? Or well, I'm not sure you would call it that. Right. Let me finish. Okay, please. Uh, there was a there was a high speed uh, following on the highway, uh, probably at the same speeds as other cars on a California uh, highway. When this car exited, the border patrol followed the car. It was doing no more than 25 miles an hour. Pulled into a shopping center parking lot. And at that point, the Border Patrol felt that probably, as had been their experience, these people would stop and run. Instead, they turned around and at that point showed for the first time an intent to evade arrest. They drove across the median and went the wrong way on into incoming traffic, then took a left. At that point, the Border Patrol equipment failed. We don't ever get to a point where there was a high-speed pursuit because the, the siren and uh, the light were inoperable. Uh, the Border Patrol followed the policy, which is no pursuit without uh, the equipment. 
Uh, and so they followed pretty much at a distance. Uh, still, the vehicle fled at a high speed and ran into the intersection, hence the tragedy. So, in other words, the, the vehicle was, was running at a high rate of speed without being chased? Yes, sir. All right, uh, just a couple other questions. Um, you mentioned several jurisdictions. Uh, I believe I heard you say Chicago is one. You mentioned several others that I didn't make note of. LA and uh, San Francisco, to thank be you. Uh, specific. Uh, officially have their law enforcement agencies not cooperate with the INS? Is, is that what yes, I Yes, I think councils in those uh, cities, and in some California cities, they've uh, actually declared themselves to be sanctuary cities for uh, mm -hmm. illegal aliens. So you're not talking about just in a chase policy, you're talking about across the board. Across the board, lack of cooperation. And this is through some kind of official action by a city council or county commission or a chief executive or something like that? Yes, sir. Um, finally, uh, let me ask you, uh, I, I know the question I'm about to ask you could be answered at great length because I'm deliberately making it open-ended, but uh, ask you to be, be as concise as possible. Uh, Mr. McNary and, and also uh, Mr. Williams, if, if, you, if you choose, Chief, if you had the magic wand, uh, you, could, you could, we don't have it here, you know, we're, we're limited also in many ways, but if you had the magic wand and could do anything that you wanted to stem the high rate of illegal immigration to this country, what would you do? Well, I would, I, I can answer that in a few words. I would ask um, uh, for two things. I would ask for the resources uh, to to bring under control, and if a few people come across illegally, we can live with that. We can't live with 3,000 people a day or night coming across that border without this kind of a tragedy and without a lot of other problems facing this country. The two things I'd ask for is resources to, to do the job, to stop that hole, really, it's a hole in the, in the border, uh, and to plug it. And secondly, I would ask for the support of this Congress. More important than the resources. We can bring that border under control if, when all the special interest groups come out and say, well, you're building a wall and walls are coming down all over the world and this is inhumane and all of the other things that tend to back people away, if Congress says, we're tired of this and all the problems. We are a sovereign nation. We're going to stop people from coming through in that 12 miles. They've got 2,000 that they can still come across. We're not building a, a high vertical wall along the entire border. But just in that 12 miles, we can bring it under control. But we have to have a Congress and a, and a federal government that says, enough of this. We're a sovereign nation, and it's going to stop. Thank you very much. Do you want to add anything, Chief? I'm sorry. Well, I don't know what I can add to that. Thank you. All right. <laughs> All right. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Condit. Yes, I, I have just a couple questions for uh, Commissioner McNary. Um, d does your uh, the Border Patrol people get the same kind of training as other law enforcement people? Well, it's not exactly the same, and we can go into specifics. They're, they're trained uh, in different ways. We think they're trained better, actually. They all speak Spanish. Uh, they're trained in immigration laws. Uh, investigators are trained to, to the, in the basic, uh, and as well as Border Patrol, basic enforcement techniques. What is the total number of, of Border Patrol officers, personnel you have? We have about four, th well, probably 4,500 Border Patrol personnel, 4,000 officers. California? <coughs> Not well. 900 in San Diego. Chief? About, uh, 300, about 1,200 altogether. 1,200 altogether in California. Uh, maybe uh, uh, you, this answer to this question is in this documentation somewhere. I, I, I haven't seen it. Uh, you have similar pursuit uh, policies as other major law enforcement agencies? Our pursuit policy is, is in transition. And it was being revised, as I mentioned, uh, before the Temecula incident. Along with general arrest and firearms policy, those are being revised. Well, what, we have done, what we have done is to shift from a more discretionary pursuit policy to a more res restrictive pursuit policy. Uh, and um, both have, uh, have a... Uh, 
a support really in the law enforcement community. I think something like 26 percent have the discretionary policy, 50 some percent have the more restrictive policy, and we've gone to the more restrictive. Yes. Now. Well, do, do you have statistical information that you, uh, w w you know, what kind of accidents you've had with your pursuit policy versus what kind of accidents may be a law enforcement agency comparable to your size in California? Is that is your is your incident rate of accidents equivalent, <coughs> higher, lower? Actually, it's lower. Now, you know, there may be different comparisons, but the comparison we've made is that out of 100 pursuits, we have about 3.8 accidents, which is lower than the ratio for other agencies. Okay. Um, I, that's, I guess that's all I, I want to, to, to ask you, except to, to, to also echo the comments of, I guess, the, my colleague down there about to um, help with uh, local agencies. Do you have any recommendation that we can do to get uh, assistance from these local cities and local law enforcement agencies to the Border Patrol? I'm, it is, a, I, I think, unfortunate that we have these two agencies that are supported by tax dollars that we don't uh, work in concert to try to achieve the objectives. And uh, do you have any recommendations from the federal government, from Congress, that what we can do to be um, helpful in seeing that at least there's a cooperative spirit? Congressman, you know, I really, I believe the people of, of California, which may be the, the most serious problem, would be very supportive of a law to the effect that uh, when, when the illegal, when an illegal immigrant uh, asked for any benefit or came in contact with any federal agency, that the INS be notified. Further, that INS uh, and the Border Patrol, the enforcement uh, divisions, be uh, given the support and the reciprocity with other federal law enforcement agencies. I don't, I, you know, until I became commissioner of this agency, I was uh, under the impression that law enforcement agencies did cooperate. But I should tell you that this is not an easy undertaking because of the special interests that will raise a hue and cry if there's any assistance given to INS. Well, do you not have, uh, I, I, they used to call them, I get joint powers agreement uh, if, w with cities and counties where you maybe have duplicate services? Congressman, uh, we cooperate on a local level many times uh, with local law enforcement agencies, especially if it's an emergency or an urgent nature. Uh, if, if, uh, if there's a drunk that's uh, uh, on the highway and, and he refuses to stop and there's just one local policeman available, we will assist them. Uh, but uh, it's been the trend that, uh, that local law enforcement agencies, uh, generally directed by their councils and their governments, uh, have been uh, asked not to be uh, enforcing immigration laws or proactively assisting the immigration service in, in enforcing those laws. We do work well together, especially on any emergent nature, uh, joint drug investigations and things like that. But when it comes to the, the, uh, the ticklish issue of illegal immigration, people back off. So you actually have no contractual agreement and any no, kind of joint powers no. agreement with any local agencies no. at all? No, Thank you very much. Mr. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. McNary and Mr. Williams, we've talked about uh, quite a bit the Border Patrol pursuit policy. I'd like you to uh, comment for the record what specific training prior to the uh, fielding of a new officer does the Border Patrol give in uh, pursuit <coughs> education, and then once the officer has uh, been assigned, what type of uh, review training takes place as it relates to automobiles and pursuits? Let me say what I, what I know about that. It is 42 hours of pursuit training as part of their, um, their four-month uh, uh, original training, and, and uh, six hours is dedicated to the uh, high speed, but uh, Chief, why don't you uh, respond to that? Congressman, uh, <coughs> we have 42 hours basic training at our academy in Glencoe, Georgia. Now, this part of our training is a joint effort 
uh, not only conducted just for the Border Patrol, but for any federal law enforcement agency that has uh, a role at the academy, and there, there are numerous ones there. So the curriculum is a joint initiative, uh, the, the best thinking, the, uh, the, it's, it's the, the, the teachers are staffed with, uh, other than Border Patrol instructors, uh, it's, it's just a, a community effort to, uh, to provide the instruction. Um, as the commissioner said, we have uh, uh, instruction on uh, felony vehicle stops, on skid control, on four-wheel drive vehicles, highway response driving, which is in effect uh, part of pursuit driving, uh, night driving techniques, uh, pursuit driving itself, uh, as well as an orientation. Uh, following that, uh, as we have resources available, and as we have classrooms available, we do have advanced journeyman training. However, we have not been able to get all our journeymen into that, uh, where there, I think, is an additional 24 hours of pursuit driving and, and training. Uh, many of them do get a chance to get through it. Uh, it's usually uh, we're behind the curve, though, on, on, uh, on providing that uh, at our facility at Artesia, New Mexico. But basically, and I, if I could just finish, our training <coughs> Uh, in comparing it with other agencies that attend or, or who uh, uh, participate in the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center at Georgia, ours is, is very comparable to theirs and in a rambling sampling of other departments, municipal part departments, state police, uh, ours is very comparable to theirs also. Last uh, Friday, the INS issued uh, a new pursuit policy guideline letter I understand that these policies are now out for review and comment. When is it anticipated that this new policy uh, would be implemented? Congressman, uh, we're going to move as quickly as we can. Uh, we're, we're bound by certain procedures. Uh, T.J. Bonner uh, with the Border Patrol Union is here, and uh, he, he knows where we can establish the policy. I have that within my control, but the, the implementation, the impact uh, needs to be communicated with the union, uh, and we'll, we'll try to expedite that as quickly as possible. I know from experience... Yeah, just, can, Congressman, can, can, I, yeah. can I add to that just a moment, please, sir? I'm no expert on pursuit policy, but I've been reading a lot lately about it. And I tell you, there, there's a lot of, of, in fact, I understand we have several expert witnesses here, and, and, and I'm going to, to listen with interest as to what they have to say. But in my review of policies that uh, other agencies, state police, municipalities, uh, have, have, have uh, adopted, and in the, in, the, in the various studies that have gone on, there's great differences of opinion. And, and, uh, and, and data is still being collected on it. And what I want to be able to do, and I'm going to need a little time, is to cover all these bases. So when our officers are out there on the street, they have the clear understanding of what is required of them once we have made these changes and to provide the training necessary for them to be able to carry out their mission safely. Let me uh, say that I also have gotten involved in high pursuit policies. And I think probably uh, one of the best that I have read of all of them in its conciseness is the California Highway Patrol. And I recommend them to you because in, in essence everything they do is high speed. And they have also learned uh, sometimes the hard way uh, what policies work the best. But one of my concerns here is that irrespective of how well managed our policies are relative to high pursuit it became evident in, re in reading the report that you referred to earlier Commissioner on this on this incident that the communication system uh, dealing with uh, the circumstances from the beginning to the end left an awful lot to be desired is this because of maintenance, or is this because of inability of these systems to communicate? Uh, I might add the chief one of which is uh, no other agencies were notified beyond that of, the, of your family of agencies that uh, activities were taking place in this corridor during the period of time that we're talking about. Uh, Congressman, the, um, 
the communications were normal and regular. Now, were they as sophisticated uh, and airtight as we would like them to be? No. Well, let me, let me stop you because the report that you gave me, which was the report from the, the inspector that you sent, continually talked about the breaking up of communications, the inability of one unit to communicate with the other and so forth, which no, I'll, I'll, is I'll the reason that. for my asking the question. And I, I, I interrupted you because what you're telling me they were normal then that would be something we would need to explore. Yeah, well, what you've cited and what I've said are both correct. They're normal because there is a distance here um, of 100 miles. At one time, there was uh, a failure in radio communications, and uh, the officer had to stop and use a telephone in order to, to make the communication. Now, that's normal because it happens, uh, I don't know if it's frequent, but there are dead spots where they have to use the phone because the radio communication uh, will not, will not, not go through. It's not a mechanical failure then. It's not a mechanical failure. It's something that happens. We're, uh, we're going to, to use more cellular, cellular phones. We're, uh, we're making changes that we hope will overcome that and, and improve uh, the situation. Now, with regard to the second part, the uh, communications with other agencies, as you recall, as I've described the, the point in time which was crucial, uh, this was not a pursuit. We had a car that pulled into a shopping center, was not at a high speed at that point, and then it fled. There was no indication to the, to the Border Patrol uh, at that point, that uh, uh, that anybody else, uh, up until that point, that anybody else should be notified, and it was just seconds, as you know, after they fled, that the accident had occurred. Unfortunately, that last buzzer means that we have ten minutes to get over to the floor and vote, Mr. Chairman, and maybe we can continue this uh, after that takes place. Uh, there are two votes, actually. This, this is a previous question. There will be an immediate vote following that. We have a one witness I know with a, a plane problem. What I would ask is uh, during this recess, which I hope will be around 20 minutes and no longer, um, what I would ask is that our staffs negotiate with the witnesses to see if we can move things around a little bit. I have a round of questions also, Commissioner, I'd like to, to uh, address. Uh, so having said that, um, uh, why don't we encourage some flexibility uh, and we'll go vote and be back as soon as possible. The committee will stand uh, in recess. Subcommittee will resume. Um. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm delighted to see that uh, there have been some negotiations to accommodate some of the witnesses. Uh, the subcommittee at this time will interrupt its examination uh, and hearing the testimony of uh, Commissioner McNary and Chief Williams, uh, and will ask uh, John Wetzel, Chief of Police, International Association of Chiefs of Police from Choctaw, Oklahoma. If you'd take stand, um, Mr. Wetzel is practice this subcommittee swearing all witnesses, uh, so it's not to prejudice any witness. Would you raise your right hand? You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Your written statement in its entirety is already made a part of the record, and I'd invite you to summarize in any way you wish. Chairman, I do appreciate you rearranging the schedule to uh, accommodate this. Chairman Wise, distinguished members of the subcommittee, my name is John Wetzel. I'm the Chief of Police in Choctaw, Oklahoma. I have the privilege of serving as the fourth Vice President of the International Association of Chiefs of Police, and I'm here in that capacity today. The Association's President, Chief Roland Vaughn of Conyers, Georgia, is unfortunately out of the country and requested that I represent him at the subcommittee hearing today. The ICP was established in 1983 and currently represents over 13,000 individuals involved in law enforcement management worldwide. 
The goal of IACP, as stated in its constitution, is to advance the science and art of, of police services. This includes developing and disseminating improved administrative, technical, and operational practices and promoting their use in police work. Uh, <clears throat> I have been asked by the subcommittee to testify regarding IACP's model policy on vehicular pursuit, as well as the different pur pursuit policies used by law enforcement today and the law enforcement and public pol policy implications of each. Before doing so, let me briefly express IACP's disappointment that the California Highway Patrol was not able to accept the subcommittee's invitation to testify. At the Highway Patrol's request, we are pleased to testify in their behalf. Before discussing the details of IACP's model pursuit policy, I believe it may be worthwhile for the subcommittee to know a small part of my personal history. In 1980, I lost my first wife and two-year-old daughter and had a four-year-old daughter critically injured as a result of an Oklahoma Highway Patrol trooper's pursuit of three motorcycles for minor traffic violations in an area just west of my community, Choctaw. Even though two of the motorcycle riders soon pulled over to give up, the trooper continued pursuing the third motorcycle into a residential area and through a section line intersection obscured by tall weeds, proceeding past a stop sign at 100 miles per hour in a 25 mile per hour zone. The trooper's vehicle struck and demolished my private vehicle, driven by my first wife, which had just entered the intersection. I myself was dispatched to the accident scene to assist, and was not aware until 15 minutes after my arrival that my family lay crushed in this carnage. There are no words that can describe the trauma that I went through. As dangerous as pursuits can be, they are a necessary element of law enforcement's ability to apprehend criminals and prevent them from causing further damage to our society. Law enforcement must have the authority to engage in pursuits. Both because of my personal experience with the dangers of police pursuits and my understanding that pursuits are a tool law enforcement must have, I consider the existence of a model pursuit policy to be absolutely critically important to law enforcement. In 1990, the IACP released its official model policy on vehicular pursuit. This policy is a guide to departments across the country in the formulation of their individual pursuit policies. The policy issue confronting law enforcement and municipal administrators is a familiar one of balancing conflicting interest. On one side, there is a need to enforce the laws, both large and small. If a law enforcement agency is known not to engage in high-speed pursuits, then its credibility with both law-abiding citizens and law violators will suffer and effectively uh, and effectiveness may be diminished. On the other side, there is the safety of law enforcement officers, of fleeing drivers and their passengers, and of innocent bystanders. ICP's model vehicular pursuit policy recognizes these balancing problems in its policy statement and recommends a restrictive vehicular pursuit policy as the preferred means of meeting a law enforcement agency's obligation. Restrictive for the purpose of this model policy is given to mean that the officers should be placed under a series of carefully defined constraints and pursuits should be subjected to close supervision and review. The ICP model begins with a very specific definition of vehicular pursuit. A vehicular pursuit is an attempt by an officer in an authorized emergency vehicle to apprehend fleeing suspects who are attempting to avoid apprehension through evasive tactics. This is an important definition because it indicates that a pursuit is only undertaken when the individual fleeing has demonstrated a desire to evade the law, thereby creating reasonable suspicion. The actual procedures for conducting a vehicular pursuit are broken down into detailed and different responsibilities depending upon the stage of the pursuit, the location of the pursuit, and the role of the given officer involved. The model policy is made up of nine specific areas of action and responsibility. The initiation of pursuit, pursuit officer responsibilities, communication center responsibilities, field supervisor's responsibilities during vehicular pursuit, traffic regulations during pursuit, pursuit tactics, determination of pursuit, interjurisdictional inter pursuit, and preparation of comprehensive analysis of every pursuit to be forwarded to the chief of that agency. The IACP policy is stringent about criteria which must exist before a pursuit can be initiated. For instance, the suspect must exhibit an intention to avoid arrest. The suspect must know that an officer is trying to stop 
and, and refused to stop for that officer. And the suspect would represent a danger to human life or cause serious injury if allowed to flee. Once a pursuit has been initiated, the pursuing officer must notify the communications center of the pursuit and a number of facts regarding the pursuit, among them the unit identification, location, speed, and direction of travel of the fleeing vehicle, and reasons to support, to support the decision to pursue. This information is essential to a field supervisor assigned to monitor the pursuit to help determine whether to allow the pursuit to continue. Upon being notified that a pursuit has begun, the communications center has a number of notification and coordination responsibilities critical to maintaining the safety and efficiency of a pursuit. Another vital component of the pursuit is the field supervisor, who is responsible for monitoring and controlling the pursuit as it progresses, continually reviewing incoming data to determine whether the pursuit should be continued or terminated. This includes directing pursuit vehicles or air units in and out of the pursuit, redesigning or re redesignating units as primary backup or support units, approving, disapproving, and coordinating tactics, and approving or disapproving leaving the jurisdiction to continue the pursuit. Regardless of the overall nature of the pursuit, the model policy stresses certain rules regarding traffic regulations during pursuit, specifically the standard of reasonable care. Pursuing officers are to turn on their headlights and all emergency equipment at the beginning of the pursuit. They are to maintain reasonable care for themselves and for all of the persons and property at all times during the pursuit. Pursuing officers are permitted to suspend conformance with normal traffic regula regulations only as long as <clears throat> only as long as uh, they they re exercise reasonable care when driving in a manner not otherwise permitted, and the maneuver is necessary to gain control of the suspect. On the part of the policy dealing with pursuit tactics, the policy explicitly prohibits ramming a suspect's vehicle to force it off the road. While it does not address two other tactics, boxing in and roadblocks, it states that these tactics should be discouraged or prohibited. Perhaps the most critical elements of any pursuit policy are the procedures governing termination of a pursuit. Pursuits may be terminated before apprehension of the suspect by the pursuing officer, by the field supervisor, or by the chief executive officer of the department. The model policy stresses the point that termination of a pursuit may be the most rational means of preserving life and property. It specifies three circumstances calling for immediate termination of a pursuit. Whether, <clears throat> whether or traffic conditions substantially increase the danger of pursuit beyond the worth of apprehending the suspect. The distance between the pursuit and fleeing vehicles becomes so great that further pursuit is futile. And three, the danger posed to the public, the officers, or the suspect is greater than the value of apprehending the suspect. The first and third of these criteria show the balancing of value that continues throughout the entire pursuit. The final element of the model policy is pursuit analysis. This requires the preparation of a comprehensive analysis of every pursuit to be forwarded to the chief executive officer of that agency. The final stage of the model policy suggests that when a chief has reviewed this information, he or she determine whether the pursuit was within departmental policy. The chief's role is also to determine whether there are any training needs to be considered and whether any policy changes need to be considered. Mr. Chairman, as you can see, policies concerning vehicular pursuit are very detailed and require a number of conditions to be met to initiate or continue a pursuit. These policies are backed by the threat of liability to the department or the individual officer. They are also backed by the threat of departmental sanctions to officers who do not comply with the policy's uh, guidelines. Media attention invariably focuses on the tragedies which occur as a result of some pursuits. And these tragedies do occur, there is no doubt. As I have indicated, I have been one of the victims. While isolated tragedies do occur, there is no reason to uniformly blame law enforcement. I would like to close with information to suggest that there should be some caution in attacking law enforcement for the unfortunate consequences of pursuits, and to demonstrate that from an overall policy framework, pursuits have been a very effective law enforcement device rel relative to the casualties caused by the pursuits. On the first point, Mr. Chairman, the Supreme Court in your own state of West Virginia recently ruled in, in favor of the Highway Patrol 
in a pursuit case brought against the patrol. The decision filed J July the 16th, 1991 in Peake v. Ratliff, West Virginia Department of Public Safety, and David Brian Akers affirms the judgment of the Circuit Court of Mercer County in this case. Ms. Peake sued because she had been injured by a fleeing vehicle as a result of the pursuit. The court, however, found that common sense dictates that a different standard ought to apply when officers are in pursuit of a lawbreaker who, in the ensuing chase, collides with and injures a third party. The duty to pursue and apprehend law violators should not be fettered by the specter of secondary liability based on a care of due standard. It is the law violator who, in his efforts to escape justice, collides with the third party and directly causes the injuries. Only when an officer is guilty of gross negligence or reckless conduct in the pursuit that causes or contributes to the collision by the lawbreaker should liability attach. The transcript of the court decision gives a detailed account explaining how the officers acted within the law and public safety to pursue a known criminal and how that criminal's vehicle was out of control. One reason for bringing this case to the attention of the subcommittee has to do with its relationship to the Border Patrol incident in Temecula, California. <coughs> Tragedies and casualties unfortunately occur, but as in Temecula, it is especially important to understand who is truly responsible. The ISCP understands that the Border Patrol's pursuit policy is the subject of these hearings. As such, it is important to, know that the to note that the Border Patrol vehicular pursuit policy is within sufficient conformity to the ISCP model that this association believes that it is fully, in that it is fully adequate. The other closing point deals with the justification for pursuits. As the ISCP model states, the benefits must outweigh the risk. In Congressman McCandless' state of California, the Highway Patrol has gathered data together to demonstrate how minimal the accidents are and how large the number of arrests are. I have a copy of those figures on a separate document and would ask Mr. Chairman that that document be made a part of the hearing record. Mr. Chairman, thank you, thank you for the opportunity to present ISCP's views on the critical issue of public safety and pursuits. The risk of pursuit do indeed exist, but they have been truly minimized through agency policies, and pursuits are a law enforcement tool that law enforcement cannot live or work without. Chief Wetzel, thank you very much for your testimony and, and for sharing your experiences with us as well. Um, I also note I can tell why you're a good chief because of all the legal authority that's available through the 50 states. You went to the most relevant case law. Um, <laughs> um, the, um, could you help me, and we're going to make sure that you don't have to do uh, a rapid pursuit to get to the airport. I want to assure you that no, uh, my understanding that. is you have to be heading out of here at 115, is that correct? There, thereabouts. Okay. Um, let me just ask, say to the subcommittee, this is a motion to adjourn. Um, I'm prepared um, to skip this vote to keep this hearing going. If, if others want to go, that's fine, and I'll, that's, uh, that's fine, but uh, I'm going to stay here and, and just keep this proceeding. I don't think uh, uh, these, the panelists ought to be subjected to our procedural uh, battles uh, over on the floor. Let the record show that's why I'm staying, incidentally, um, <laughs> the, uh, and missing this vote. Um, the, um, <clears throat> so that I can understand a little bit in, li in listening to your, in reading your testimony this morning and in, in uh, reviewing the, the uh, vehicular pursuit policy that is part of, that is Appendix 2 of Commissioner McNary's, uh, it, there is, um, uh, am I correct that the order of sequence is that, the recommended sequence is that an officer has to make an immediate decision whether or not to engage in pursuit, but as soon as he does, then he, is, he contacts or communicates with the dispatcher to inform them. It, se it seems to me that in reading the Border Patrol's policy that a supervisory personnel is immediately contacted and, and uh, uh, makes a decision about, <coughs> ideally makes a decision about whether or not that pursuit should continue. Is that correct? Is that a fair statement? Yes. And is that also the recommended policy that uh, that that your organization supports? Yes, the officer has to make a decision on whether to terminate based upon facts that are known to him and available to him at the time. And when you say the officer, are you referring to the supervisory officer at the <coughs> communication center? 
No, I'm talking about initially, uh, the initial engagement of pursuit is a decision, discretionary decision that is left to the officer in the field. Once, uh, once the officer makes that decision and then notifies the communications, then the field supervisor or the supervisory responsibilities come into play. What if, in your case, in the case of the recommended policy uh, of your organization, what if the field supervisor is not available? Uh, if a field supervisor is not available, then that officer, uh, and, and many times it may not be uh, in a smaller agency. Uh, in a larger agency, you will have probably at least senior officers uh, who, uh, who may have much more seniority than the officer in initiating pursuit. And there should be some provision that if a supervisor is, uh, is, is not on duty, that at least a senior officer then has a responsibility to make a decision. Um. In your, in your association's model pursuit policy, you cite a number of parameters, uh, traffic and weather conditions, nature of the offense, supervisory officers, and others. Some of these do not seem to be present in the present INS guidelines. And uh, I just wonder whether, and yet you say that these guidelines are acceptable. Uh, do, you, is there any, do you see any problem with the fact these parameters are not, all these parameters are not there, or do you think that the reasonable person standard covers that? Well, while I think certainly the reasonable person standard covers it, uh, I think that when we talk about uh, over, you know, generally adequate, adequate based upon IACP model policies, every agency will, will not, even my agency, uh, has policy which uh, certainly uh, comes from and it was developed around the model policy. However, it's developed more specifically to my agency than it is to, to any other agency. And I think that that's what we see in the development of policy in the U.S. Uh, Border Sur Service. Uh, you're going to have an overall general policy, and then you're going to develop specific policy to that area or, or to that agency. Are you not also, you're from uh, Choctaw, Oklahoma, which I uh, believe is a fairly rural area. Yes, sir. Uh, I come, I represent <coughs> mainly a rural areas as well. Uh, we're a bit more mountainous than you are, but we still run into a lot of... Um, uh, dead zones as far as communications, radio communications between uh, uh, an officer, state highway patrol, or and the uh, uh, dispatcher. Um, how do you handle those situations? Well, un unfortunately, uh, of course, Choctaw is located in Oklahoma County, and even in Oklahoma County, unfortunately, there is no no mutual aid frequency. Uh, so there's no direct communications between federal, state, county, and 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 local that all agencies has have, all agencies have access to. Um, what we do basically is rely upon the dispatcher to make telephone or radio notification of the other agencies on their own frequency. I find that uh, that to be lacking. Uh, I, I think there should be a mutual aid frequency in in all locations where a single frequency where whether you're with the federal government or with the local government if there is an emergency situation or a pursuit there would be a common channel available to everybody is this something that from your experience is not uh, there's not consensus on in the law enforcement community i note that there's some disagreement with that approach and testimony that we're going to hear later um, I just wondered if, if, does your association have a position on a mutual aid frequency? Uh, I do not believe we have ever taken a position on that. It's certainly something that we need to look at that. We do have a, a sub or a committee, uh, a communications committee that works in that area. Uh, and, and it's certainly something that we can address through IACP. In, in my personal opinion, I think that it's something that's very necessary for law enforcement across the country. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Mr. McCandless? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You pretty well covered the uh, waterfront with the questions I had in mind. Thank you, Mr. Schiff. Just two questions, uh, Chief Wetzel. The first is, I, you said it, but I just want to make sure I have it clearly. In, in your opinion, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, please uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but in your opinion, the current uh, policy of the U.S. Border Patrol with respect to uh, uh, when and how to have uh, pursuit chases uh, is an acceptable policy? Within the, within the parameters of a model policy that IACP has, yes. Would the gentleman yield, just for purposes of clarification, when we say present policy, uh, I assume you're, are, we re are you referring to the policy dated uh, July the 21st, 1992? Yes. Uh, that uh, was introduced as part of, as appendix two to, the, to Commissioner McNary's testimony? Yes. Thank you. 
What about the older policy? Are you familiar with that? I'm not familiar with that. All right. Second and final question. Uh, Mr. McNary testified, and I believe you, you heard him, that there are some jurisdictions that do not cooperate with the uh, Immigration Naturalization Service uh, as a matter of policy. Uh, were you familiar with that? No, I wasn't. Uh, one of the things that I already have a note on here is to, uh, is to try to address that issue through the International Association <coughs> of Chiefs. We'll be meeting uh, in Detroit in October. And I certainly think that's an issue that we need to address as Chief Administrator. What I was hoping you would say. Thank you, Chief. I have no further questions, Mr. Chairman. I would like to, to make one other comment. I, I had heard earlier uh, a comment about uh, civilian review. And uh, certainly while, while I appreciate the fact that citizens need to be involved in our governmental process, uh, I want you to understand that in my situation uh, that the Oklahoma Highway Patrol reviewed the actions of this trooper uh, in two different administrative hearings, uh, found him negligent, and fired this trooper. Uh, this was after he had been charged with two counts of negligent homicide and before a jury where he appeared every day in <coughs> uniform, uh, the jury, uh, citizens, uh, six citizens, could not reach a verdict and it ended in a hung jury. Uh, following that, the Highway Patrol had two administrative hearings. Both of those found him negligent, and the commissioner fired him. The next uh, appeal on his part was to the Civilian Oklahoma Personnel Board. The Civilian Oklahoma Personnel Board heard the case and ignored the recommendations of professional law enforcement administrators and reinstated this trooper with 75 days suspension and loss of pay. Um, and that was after he testified at, the, at all hearings that had he had the same thing to do and the same circumstances to do, that the same circumstance presented itself and he had the same decision to make again, that he would make the same decision knowing the consequences. So I would, I would urge at least uh, some consideration. I would like to, to uh, introduce some remarks that I make in, in addresses across the country that detail that. But I'm not necessarily convinced, due to my personal experience, that, uh, that civilian review in cases where you have professional law enforcement who are trained to judge professional law enforcement actions necessarily result in a benefit to the citizens. In my case, it did not. Thank you very much, Chief. Any further? <coughs> Chairman, uh, I can yield for just a minute, Mr. Wetzel. Yes, sir. Uh, not knowing exactly, <clears throat> other than what you have told us about the civilian aspect of your comment, the opening statement that I made was more of a public relations, we're all in the community together, uh, let's work toward a common cause type of relationship between the the people of the community and the members of the Border Patrol family and was in no way uh, directed toward some type of a local civilian review if, if that's the kind of thing that you were thinking about. Yeah, I, th I think it's very important to have citizen involvement in, in our agencies and in, in uh, government, uh, and I certainly agree with that. Thank you. Chief, thank you for the efforts you've made to be here today. Thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner McNary, uh, Chief Williams, I want the subcommittee thanks you for uh, being flexible, and we'll resume uh, resume your testimony. I believe we were with Mr. McCandless. Thank you. Uh, let's let's take what it is that you have produced and given us a copy of, with respect to the proposed revised uh, pursuit policy. Could you summarize that, uh, Mr. Williams, Mr. McNary, whoever wishes to, just a, a summary of the, of the differences between what the current policy is and what you are proposing and what is under review. Uh, my quick estimate of this, and if you wish to expand on it, please do. There are two elements there that were not necessarily present in the previous policy. The one is the, the introduction into the formula of pursuit a supervisory level <clears throat> as a part of the required uh, action on the part of the officer involved. And secondly, a notification of the local law enforcement jurisdiction of uh, the action being taken 
There may be other, others, but uh, those stand out for purposes of our discussion. Is that, do I have a correct assessment of this? Congressman, the, um, to give you a, a um, definition of uh, how the high pursuit would be triggered or an explanation of that, let me point out in the, uh, in the policy statement, item three talks in terms of initiation criteria, and that's what you're referring to uh, as a time when a supervisor must be notified. There are four requirements. I'm familiar with that. I'm talking ter in general terms about the, the general differences between the two. Okay, the differences are, uh, in a word, the old policy was discretionary, the new policy is restrictive. The difference is, is C, which uh, requires the suspect, if allowed to flee, would present a danger to human life or cause serious injury unless at the time when there is an evasion the officer believes that uh, if this person was allowed to, to run, in other words, he's a drive-by shooter or something of, uh, of that nature, then he would not pursue. He would not pursue. Now, if he believes that that uh, is the circumstance and that this is an individual who presents a danger uh, to human life or, or body, uh, then he contacts the supervisor, and the supervisor is, is responsible for the network notification. And even then, the supervisor will control <coughs> The uh, pursuit, uh, there will be a, there is defined a termination time. It may be that the circumstances will change. Even though this is a wild person shooting out of the windows, I, I, I they may run into a, a school zone at which time the, the pursuit would, would be terminated. That, that is a, a significant change from the old policy, which left the discretion to the officer uh, and he balanced uh, the, uh, the harm uh, to the public in both cases, allowing someone to flee against uh, what dangers were presented uh, by a chase. I have a concern, and I would appreciate a response, that uh, reading Mr. Chase's report, which you released to us and to others, that the communication system currently in place as it relates to San Diego and Riverside counties is uh, very inadequate to properly communicate between a person involved or about to become involved in the chase and a supervisory level. And I have uh, in a previous life been involved with county government and and we had two things that we wanted to try to accomplish with respect to the communication system. A, that the, the sheriff in the field had communication at all times with his home base. And B, that that communication presented him with a level of safety then that he would not have otherwise, since they were single patrol units, single man patrol units. There are, on occasions, in the mountains in the San Diego Riverside area where most of your work is taking place, certain blank spots that are, that are not achievable for communication. Do you have in place an adequate system in San Diego County where all of the action is, if you permit me to use that pun, that adequately gives you what you need in the way of communication for the purposes of implementing this chase program? No, sir. There, are, but the policy does guard against a pursuit when there's no communication with a supervisor. It's clear that if he can't communicate with a the supervisor, then there's there's no uh, high speed. The the uh, felon flees. 
Also, uh, <coughs> Congressman, uh, we do have initiated a, 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 a changeover in our radio communication network in several of our what we call sectors, which would be areas of, of, of responsibility. Uh, but this is a replacement communication system that would enable us to go to voice privacy. It is not an expansion. And you're, you're quite correct in that in your, in your particular area in Riverside County and in San Diego County, there are a lot of dead spots and there are a lot of places we would like to put repeaters that would enable us to communicate better, but there's no electricity there. Uh, what we have uh, uh, in, in the mill is to, is to start a, a, do a, a communication engineering survey, but I'm afraid that we're going to be talking about quite a bit of money uh, to be put into that particular area if we're going to get a marked improvement of our radio communication ability. I have one other area I want to cover. In my wanderings around, uh, I was at the Cane Springs uh, stop point, which is over on Highway 86 in Imperial County, and spent some time here a while back with the two officers that were there at the checkpoint. <coughs> Having come from the automobile and truck business, uh, I'm somewhat familiar with mechanical and other types of activities as they relate to cars and trucks. I, I took a look at the vehicle in question, and after looking at it uh, and literally kicking the tires in a couple of locations, I found that, to, at least uh, in my mind, that this was an overage vehicle which probably would have at, at some point under strain mechanical problems that would be detrimental to, to a, a high-speed chase or in some other way detrimental to the, the circumstances surrounding the activity of the vehicle. Um, I'd like your observations as, as they relate to the vehicles being used in the high-intensity high areas where uh, it is not just a patrol type of activity, but one could assume or at least count on a higher level of activity simply based upon the numbers of people involved and the activity level of the, of the Border Patrol's responsibility. The um, Border Patrol currently has 15 INS-owned garages which perform both minor and major maintenance repairs uh, and service on Border Patrol vehicles where the INS garage is unavailable, commercial garages are utilized for vehicle maintenance. A complete safety inspection is performed on every Border Patrol vehicle on a monthly basis or every 3,000 miles, whichever comes first. In addition, agents are required to conduct a daily inspection of their assigned vehicles, and if an agent determines that a vehicle requires repairs, uh, which render it unsafe for field operation, the vehicle is removed from service and another vehicle is issued. And Congressman, you know, this has been a major concern of mine since I came into this job two and a half, three years ago, because we were far behind on, uh, <coughs> on replacement, uh, that we weren't even close to any kind of a scientific replacement repair program. We have, um, in 1991, uh, 11.9 million was put into replacement of vehicles. We got 747 new ones. In 92, there were 475, uh, 8 million. And we're gradually uh, catching up, uh, but uh, we're still far behind. We have too many miles on too many vehicles. I, I get information from other sources that if we were to take uh, the Temecula station, where I understand there are 15, was that 15 uh, <coughs> patrol units and a miscellaneous number of other vans and vehicles? Does that sound about right? We have more vehicles than that at Temecula. Uh, okay, at any one time, uh, possibly as many as five might be available. The others have either been cannibalized or in some way rendered uh, inactive, either through uh, a need for higher maintenance or something. Would that be reflective of, uh, of other locations? Congressman, uh, at one point uh, several months back, we, we were suffering a, an internal crisis in San Diego with our vehicle fleet. and. We were uh, in dire straits in terms of operable vehicles. I'm talking San Diego sector in general. 
<clears throat> we have uh, transferred some vehicles. We've, we've pumped some more money into it. But the, the sad truth is that it uh, uh, probably right now in San Diego, there are 50, uh, across the board, 50% of the vehicles need replacing. At Temecula, uh, my latest information is they have approximately uh, 50 vehicles and uh, uh, 38 are, are probably uh, replacement eligible. But that is not only in Temecula and not only in San Diego, but that's across the border. How does the Border Patrol define replaceable? What, what do you use as a criteria? There's a GSA schedule that, for instance, uh, talks about mileage, 40,000 miles. put to the field and negotiate with the union that uh, we want to, to make every effort we can to get on not only the California Claymore system, but in any community that mutual aid uh, band. Again, it's, it's, it's uh, a matter of commitment and resources, which we're going to make every effort to make. Would it, would it be unfair to uh, my colleague from West Virginia and my other colleague from New Mexico here if I were to say that uh, the sophistication of the radio system and be in direct proportion to the level of apprehension and that uh, the money available would be spent accordingly? Would that be a, a fair way of approaching it or is there another policy? No, sir. We, we put the resources where they're needed the most. Vehicles has been a critical problem. Uh, uh, when I first got to Washington two years ago, m must have been the water commissioner I got there at the same time, but when I got there, there was a, a, a short a shortage of vehicles, but the commissioner has made a commitment that with every dollar we spare dollar we have, uh, we, we, we put those into vehicles. And, and I've got to say the Department of Justice at the end of the year, if there's any loose money around, they'll, they'll give it to us for, for vehicles. They understand that commitment also. But it's not enough. We're so far behind. In order to get on a regular replacement schedule, we just don't have that kind of money to get started, to get up the level where we can start, much less get that replacement schedule going. But uh, we, we are you know, the, the congressman from West Virginia was talking about rural areas. We truly have rural areas out there in that desert in Arizona and New Mexico where we don't have, uh, where we have lots of dead spots. Uh, we, we don't have adequate communication. And, you know, we're, we're doing everything we can to improve that. Uh, but it's a major undertaking. We've got 1,900 miles of border down there just on the southern border. And there are a lot of dead spots. And it, it's difficult with the budget we have. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I've taken an awful lot of time here. I'd, I'd like uh, to submit questions in writing, and perhaps you would be kind enough to answer those for me. Uh, yes. And I appreciate the Chairman's uh, time that he's allotted. Oh, sorry. There is a um, vote on the floor, a motion to resolve in the Committee of the Whole, which is uh, I'm going to forego. I think they're going to get into the Committee of the Whole without me. Uh, if other members of the subcommittee wish to proceed, please feel free. Uh, but for the record, that's why well, I'm missing this vote as well. Um, I'd, when, I'd like to be recorded on that same page, if you don't mind. Okay. <laughs> well, the good, the good news is, for the record, Mr. McCandless and I can probably pair in the sense that I probably would be voting, he and I would probably be voting opposite of each other on this, and Mr. Schiff is going to go break the tie for us. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, only, only on voting on the floor, yeah. as far as the committee is concerned. A point well noted. Um, Commissioner, I'd like to uh, touch briefly on the the, uh, the Temecula incident and then move on to more generic discussions, uh, because you have defined it as, in effect, as, as I understand it, of not of there actually not being a pursuit uh, taking place. Um, but I think it is undisputed that at some point the lights and the sirens and lights were activated on the Border Patrol car. Is that not correct? That's correct. And when the, uh, when the Suburban, uh, driven by the, the uh, uh, fleeing aliens, when it hit uh, the, the other vehicle, um, was the patrol car in sight of the Suburban? I don't, uh, I don't believe anybody can answer that. The, the, uh, the patrol car did not have a view of the collision. They had, off and on, a glimpse of the car ahead of them. But mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 my information is that uh, there's no indication that they really 
saw the uh, collision. And what were the um, daylight conditions at the time? The, um, it was about 7.30 in the morning. I'm sorry? 7.30 in the morning, it was uh, daylight. So, so there was visibility. It, it, well, Mr. Ch I'll tell you, Mr. Chase, why don't I just swear you in so we get everybody in. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. And would you give your name and position for the record, please? My name is John Chase. I'm the Director of Internal Audit for the Immigration and Naturalization Service. And you performed the audit uh, that, the ch uh, that the commissioners referred to in earlier testimony on the Temecula uh, accident, didn't you? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, my question is whether uh, the patrol car, as I understand it, and Mr. Chase or Commissioner or Chief, uh, correct me at the point that I may be in error. Uh, as I understand it, the patrol car had activated lights and siren, or tapped the siren, I believe is the way it's referred, um, was, in, was, was uh, following the, uh, the Suburban, uh, presumably at the Suburban's rate of speed, but then lost the lights and the siren and, uh, through electrical malfunction. At that point, did the patrol car slow down? Yes, sir, it did. And at that point, was it, in effect, breaking off the chase? They broke off the chase immediately, <coughs> sir, when they lost their, uh, their power in the car. And how long a period between the time they lost the power and the time of the uh, accident? About two um, minutes. And did the patrol car lose uh, sight of the Suburban? When the uh, patrol car, first of all, when the, uh, the Suburban had already had a pretty good head start on the uh, patrol car, when it lost its its power, it did not have sight of the Suburban. Uh, they continued up the road and caught a glimpse of the Suburban as it traveled, took a left-hand turn and traveled down what Rancho Vista Road, which that's a road that leads into the intersection where the accident occurred. They caught a glimpse of it there and therefore knew that it had made that left-hand turn. They continued to follow the vehicle. They didn't have it in sight. They were traveling uh, less than the posted speed limit on Rancho Vista Road because what they were doing was checking the side streets. Uh, it was still uh, the opinion of the, the two Border Patrol agents that uh, the Suburban would pull off one of these side streets and the occupants uh, flee on foot. It's generally what smugglers and uh, illegal aliens uh, do in their experience. So they were traveling the speed limit, checking the side streets, and on two occasions on Rancho Vista Road, they caught a glimpse of the uh, Suburban. The last one, uh, about two-tenths of a mile before the intersection with Margarita Road. Um, and then they, they, they traveled into the intersection and found the uh, accident scene. When they would catch a glimpse of the uh, Suburban, did they try to speed up to catch up to it? According to the statements given to me by the by the agents, they did not. And the testimony in account, or at least accounts that I have seen and testimony I believe we're going to hear uh, s estimates that the speed of the Suburban when it hit that intersection and, and hit the other vehicle was somewhere around 80 miles an hour. Uh, at least I think it's acknowledged traveling at an excessive rate of speed. Uh, is that borne out by your investigation? I did not investigate the accident, Congressman. I investigated the the uh, events leading up to it. Um, the Temecula Police Department has investigated the, ac the accident, and I know that the 80 mile an hour figure has been uh, in the press. Um, it, it, the speed was excessive, it was not 80 miles an hour. The speed has been calculated to be 66 miles an hour. Based upon? Whatever calculations policemen do when they do those kinds of things. Commissioner or Chief, do you have anything to add to that? No. <coughs> well, you, you didn't make the, we didn't make I the did calculation. Make the calculation. That, that's <laughs> that was made by the, the accident investigators in Temecula. Okay. The, um, uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the Border Patrol then, this report has been completed. Does that effectively close the matter? So far as the uh, uh, Border Patrol officers are concerned and whether or not they followed uh, uh, 
INS policy in the in the uh, uh, pursuit of this this uh, vehicle. Yes. Let's talk some about the. Um, uh, new pursuit policy. It, and I'll turn to uh, Commissioner, you had been, you'd spoken to Mr. McCandless about the criteria for initiating pursuit. Uh, and as I read it, all four criteria have to be present in order for the pursuit to begin. As I read these, I, I'm wondering, and I would ask your opinion, uh, and I'm not trying to ask you to second-guess officers who are on the scene and, and something tragic happened. But based upon the criteria, particularly C, the suspect, if allowed to flee, would present a danger to human life or cause serious injury. Would that today trigger uh, a, a high pursuit of a van of suspected uh, aliens in and of itself? No, sir. Okay. Um, yeah, sure. Mr. Sure. Congressman, can I add to that? <clears throat> if I can, we don't want to preclude our officers from stopping, making traffic stops on illegal aliens or drug smugglers or whatever, and in, in some cases stolen vehicles. So if we can picture it again in a three-tiered sort of an uh, analysis, the traffic stop is one thing. If that vehicle were, were to blow a checkpoint, run through a checkpoint, and excessive speed is not a factor or reckless driving or high risk is not a factor, then a pursuit, as long as it's not high speed or of a reckless nature, would ensue. With notification of a supervisor, taking into things such as time of day, weather, density of traffic, population, communications with other law enforcement agencies, etc. When it got kicked into that third tier of high speed, high risk, and if you look at the top of the of the uh, of the policy, it, it basically pertains to those kinds of things that cause horrible accidents, high speed, and reckless driving. <coughs> then these criteria kick in, and it has to be based on the articulation by the officer in the vehicle and by the supervisor who immediately is monitoring at that point. Let me see if I understand, Chief. Maybe we could walk through some of those tiers. Um, you have a van at a traffic light that you suspect. Um, you, they pull out, your car um, hits the lights and the siren, they pull over. That's a traffic stop, I yes, think. Yes, sir. Uh, that van keeps proceeding uh, at uh, <coughs> 35 miles per hour and a 35 mile per hour, but doesn't stop. What do you do? We, we, we initiate pursuit. Uh, we notify a supervisor. We uh, contact radio communications to let other units know that there's a pursuit in progress. Uh, we notify local, city, county, state, whatever is available that we are in their jurisdiction, that we ask assistance in this. We take into consideration all the factors that are in the IEC policy, such as uh, the, the nature of the offense, the time of day, weather, all of that because those are factors even in a, in a, in a non-high-speed suit. But, we d but as long as those conditions are safe and we're, we're balancing and weighing out the safety of the general public with our law enforcement responsibilities, that pursuit would continue. If that same van then kicked it up to 90 miles an hour and ran across three lanes of traffic and shot off across a median, then unless we could articulate that the danger is more by not pursuing that, then pursuing it, we would break that pursuit off. Taking it a step further, if that van pulled out a shotgun and started blasting, then we would determine the danger that we would be required to pursue that, assuming the joint decision-making between the officer and the supervisor would indicate that that danger is greater than pursuing it. The, um Well, Commissioner, may I interrupt just a minute so that just from a uh, procedural standpoint, what the chief has, uh, uh, has outlined is the policy. He's, he's getting into some specifics we'll, which will be a part of the operating instructions which will still be negotiated with uh, the union before they become finalized, just so there's an mm -hmm. understanding of where we are in the transition. Mm -hmm. 
The, um, under this policy, what happens if you are in one of those radio dead spots? You initiate the pursuit, or you initiate, you hit the sirens and the lights, uh, you initiate the pursuit, uh, but you can't communicate. You're talking about high speed and high risk? Well, let's, at this point, let's keep it at the 35 miles per hour before we kick it into the third. I think, I think it, if the officer, under the officer's discretion, and my mind, and again, we're getting into what if, excuse me, what if uh, situations before we've developed the operating instructions, and, mm -hmm. and Congressman, it's incredibly uh, difficult to get through this. It's, it's, there's been a lot of internal debate. But in my mind, to answer your question, the officer, as long as he, in his discretion, as long as it wasn't high speed, and, and, and reckless driving, he would be able to continue that pursuit, uh, taking into consideration the factors that we would outline in the operating policy, such as density of population, weather conditions, traffic conditions, road conditions, et cetera. Kick it up to high speed, though, without any indices of firearms or anything he like that? He would not be... He, he, and not he can't communicate. Right. Okay. So would you know, Certainly. One thing that is not in your manual proposed rule change and something that may be a given but I think the, the committee needs to know uh, is it a given that once you engage a vehicle that immediately the license plate and identification of that vehicle are are forwarded for review and uh, determination as to whether or not it's been stolen or something else has happened? In the Border Patrol operating manual, it is, is standard procedure for us to do that, sir. Well, that's the beginning point of the pursuit that the yes. chairman's talking about. Yes. I'm chasing a 19 whatever with license number whatever. Assuming you can read it and, and yep. get Yes. This. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Chairman, this point of um, <laughs> high speed is not restricted to high speed. It could be some other dangerous evasion, as in the, the Temecula incident, when the van crossed over the median and went the wrong way uh, into oncoming traffic, Border Patrol vehicle did not do that, did not follow, but instead went down and turned around on and followed uh, the traffic laws. So it, it uh, need not be high speed. It could be any other uh, form of evasion that, that makes it clear that these people are not going to stop they're, uh, they're yeah. bent on running. Congressman, I also would like to add that this doesn't mean we're going to quit. If this thing gets into high gear, high speed and danger, we just have to look for other alternatives to try and apprehend that person. Contacting other local law enforcement agencies, getting other Border Patrol units further down the road involved, looking for air support, uh, possibly using uh, technology such as road strips, uh, talking about uh, there is some technology out about disabling vehicles uh, uh, that we uh, we need to do some R&D stuff on. But we need to, as an agency, look for other alternatives other than f chasing a vehicle at a high speed in a high risk area. And that's the challenge that, that we have and that we're accepting as administrators in this law enforcement organization. We're going to look for other alternatives to apprehend these people. We're not giving up though, and I want to make that clear. We're going after We have a duty to perform. We have an oath we've, we've taken and we're going after But we've got to do it in direct proportion to our responsibility to make it safe for the general public out there. And that's a commitment that we're making. The policy statement, uh, Commissioner, dated July 21st, 1992, uh, is that now in effect? The policy, no, it's not in effect. We, we would need to supplement it with operating instructions and train our officers um, I think because you can see that we have many of our chiefs in the room here that during the transition time there's going to be a, a more uh, circumspect handling of high-speed pursuits if we have them. So we're going to... We, if the chief points out that we, we have to negotiate with mm -hmm. the union. And On the impact of the policy. Mm -hmm. the, well, my question is, uh, does the... Uh, uh, does every Border Patrol officer have at least a policy statement at this time, or is a Border Patrol officer operating under the previous policy today? He's operating under the previous policy today. It, it would not be fair to him to give him this policy without the complex operating structures that go along with it. Um, 
I have instructed the chiefs, though, that we do want supervisory control over pursuits. And I think that, in effect, uh, there's a sensitivity in the Border Patrol about the Temecula accident, and there are not very many officers who, who want to have a repeat of that. In fact, there are no officers that want to have a repeat of that. Um, but, 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 Congressman, you know, we can ratchet down this policy, and we can do everything humanly possible as law enforcement officers to prevent the smuggling of aliens and drugs and other crimes being committed out there, but I can't guarantee no law enforcement officer can guarantee that there won't be another accident. We can't control the actions of the crook or the smuggler. We can control our officers' actions to make them as safe and give them the policy guidance to make it as safe for the community as possible. But the other day we had an officer stop a vehicle, typical stop, no problems. He walked up to the car just as he got there. He shot across four lanes of traffic. I mean, we can't prevent that kind of thing from happening. Mm -hmm. The uh, could you? Advise the subcommittee as the uh, uh, the procedure by which this will be implemented and the rough timelines that you anticipate. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Well, we uh, uh, we're in the process now of of developing operational instructions that would cover things that I think you pointed out that aren't in the policy. Uh, that's sort of an umbrella policy mo uh, skeleton of where we're going to go. But things like the time of uh, the road conditions, the weather, the time of day, the density of population, those kinds of things will be in the in the operating instructions. And again, we have to negotiate with our union on the impact that the uh, this change in policy uh, has uh, on the bargaining unit uh, employee, the officers. And uh, they have a certain time frame in which to respond. And depending on their response, uh, uh, negotiations have to take place. But to answer your question in a nutshell, we hope to move as fast as possible. I will have the operating instructions uh, uh, pretty well uh, formulated to present to the union uh, within, uh, certainly, hopefully within 30 days, but I'm, I'm working hard to do it in, in, a, in, a, in a quicker time frame. And as soon as we can, uh, we'll formally uh, sit down and hopefully that'll proceed quickly. And then uh, uh, as soon as we provide the training, uh, and, and that's the next step then is develop the training and that'll be co coincided with the development of our operating instructions. And, and then we have to uh, make sure that all the officers are familiar and understand this policy. And how, how will you conduct that training? We will. Uh, First of all, we've got two, two types of training. We've got the basic training at the academy that will kick in there immediately once the, the training is developed and the policy is developed. <coughs> and then we will uh, have on-site training uh, at our sector headquarters uh, uh, with all the officers and supervisors. And it's important that the supervisors get this training also because uh, they're the ones that are going to be monitoring and, uh, and uh, taking this policy. Because mm -hmm. my impression, looking at the California Highway Patrol uh, uh, material, uh, and their operating instructions is that some of it's pretty uh, uh, voluminous. I mean, it's it's detailed and uh, takes a while to absorb. I don't think it doesn't look to me like something you, you can just hand out and say read this uh, overnight. And there will be classroom training. I don't think we need any improvement or any increase. Uh, you know, developing more hands-on pursuit driving, but certainly classroom. And, uh, is, and, and I don't know how many hours at this point. Uh, maybe two, maybe ten. I don't know. But at this point, we will do whatever is necessary to make sure everyone. It's aware of the policy and understands it. Commissioner, the, when you signed the policy statement regarding vehicular pursuit, was it, uh, was it provided to the Border Patrol Union, the employees' union? It was, yes. Because they're, they're saying in their testimony that they didn't, did not receive it until uh, some time afterwards, I think. We, uh, we provided that uh, over a week ago and, and uh, followed up with phone calls. Um, we don't understand why it was not uh, received or acknowledged uh, by the union. But in terms of whether or not this policy is in effect, uh, it affects the contractual obligations between the um, uh, INS and the Border Patrol uh, Union, uh, technically this policy is not in effect yet. Is that correct? Technically it's not in effect. Okay. Um, either to Commissioner or the Chief, whichever one, um, could you talk a little bit about emphasis on building and maintaining community relations? Uh, I do not believe there are any full-time positions at this time of community relations liaison officers. Uh, there is a someone who's been assigned collaterally, it's my understanding, that of title of public information officer. Is this something that uh, you're looking at uh, that you think would be desirable or you don't think there's any, any role for it? Well, I think there's a role for it, Mr. Chairman. 
um, and I've asked for public information officers. We're not going to get public information. We, ha we do, in fact, have one. Uh, uh, Border Patrolman uh, uh, Steve Keene is here, uh, and he performs that function in San Diego for the Border Patrol. Virginia Keis uh, handles the region as a public uh, information officer. Uh, we were turned down for 200 Border Patrolmen, so there's no way we're going to get a public information officer. The, uh, uh, yeah, I want to get to that in just a second. Before we move to the funding situation, let me, uh, <coughs> the, the idea, the concept of mutual aid, uh, communications link up between different law enforcement agencies, is that something, it's my understanding and I thought from our conversation uh, prior to this hearing regarding the Temecula incident that there was not a link up with other law enforcement officers car to car or is that correct and is it and is that basically the pattern uh, across the border patrol congressman it varies there are times uh, when we had a high-speed chase in texas that lasted 75 miles we started it when a and this is a couple of weeks ago when a vehicle ran through one of our checkpoints it, uh, it covered 75 miles. We did communicate immediately <coughs> with other lo local law enforcement agencies. Ultimately, the chase was stopped by the Texas Department of Public Safety when it shot the tires out uh, mm -hmm. with the vehicle going the wrong way on an interstate. Uh, so there, in that case, yes, we, we make every effort to, but in many times, uh, we don't have the communication set up. Uh, the, the, the events occur so fast that we we don't have time. I mean, it may only be minutes or seconds even. Uh, and, and, uh, and so, uh, and we operate in such rural areas so many times, we're the only law enforcement agency in around. There are no others. And so we tend to rely on each other and, 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 and with our communication equipment that we have, recognizing we have dead spots. But uh, clearly on our new policy, we're going to emphasize as a other alternative to high-speed pursuit to, to Reestablish or re-strengthen our relationships with other law enforcement agencies and try and get them to be more participative in, in sure. our enforcement efforts along that border. Because, Chief, I'm asking as a layperson, is there technology available now that can shorten the communication between what I now consider the, what I would see as the present process? I assume the present process, please correct me if I'm wrong, at least in the area that uh, was Temecula, was, is that if you want to communicate with another law enforcement agency, you're in pursuit in a car and you want to communicate, you call the Border Patrol dispatcher who then contacts the dispatcher for the other law enforcement agency who contacts available cars. Correct. And, and is there anything that can short uh, circuit that, I mean, that can shorten that, uh, that well, chain? We're, we're looking at that right now, especially in Temecula. We've, we've contacted the city of Temecula uh, Police Department. Uh, there are some initiatives by Chief De La Vina and the Chief of Police in Temecula to try and and, and, and circuit that link, and, and uh, we are going to do it. Uh, across the board, there is technology, whether we can afford it, whether we can get it done, and how soon uh, is yet to be determined, but we're going we're to continue to pursue that goal. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion, properly so, about the sta status of equipment and the need for more Border Patrol officers and the need for more funding, and I don't think anyone disputes that. My question, uh, Commissioner, is, have you made requests for this in your budget submission to the Department of Justice? For what? For additional funding, additional officers, additional equipment. Yes, sir. And my next question is then whether the Department uh, passed that along and it was requested in the President's submission to the Congress. Yes, sir. As I've indicated, 200 Border Patrolmen were included in the 93 budget uh, and they were deleted. In the 93 budget. That's 93 in, budget. In the Senate. Um, well, do you have any objection uh, uh, submitting to the subcommittee your request to the Department of Justice? I have no objection. So we can then compare what the Congress is forthcoming with versus what it is that you're, you're needing? No. Uh, you, you're uh, talking about the 93 budget? 93, uh, 92, if you've got it, uh, it'd be fine too. <coughs> so that we can have a record of where, uh, where the problems are. My concern is this, I've had agency after agency in law enforcement, because we do oversight over the Department of Justice as an agency, uh, as a department wide. I have uh, uh, many department heads, uh, such as yourself, come in and validly complain 
about not having resources to do a very important mission. Upon checking, though, I find out that what happened is that the, that the administration did not submit that as part of their budget request to the Congress. You know, perhaps uh, the, there was a request for the 200 additional uh, Border Patrol personnel, but perhaps something else got deleted along the way. Uh, so I think that it's, it's important that we look at both the administration's request and also the action of Congress. Oh, it was the administration's request, 200 Border Patrolmen, and was deleted by the Congress, both uh, in the House and the Senate. Well, it's not even there for a conference. Well, that's therefore, uh, but I want to look at what the other submissions were, the other needs that you requested. Uh, which may or may not have been forwarded along. If it's on Congress's watch, then it ought to be on Congress's watch. If the administration's not asking for it all, then I don't think uh, we ought to be engaging in Congress bashing. Uh, I think we ought to be engaging in <laughs> federal government bashing. Well, I, I don't, uh, I'm not engaging in any c congressional bashing. Uh, there were two, I'm just telling you, 200 Border Patrolmen were in that budget that came to uh, the Congress. Yes, you know, a long laundry list of things that went to justice uh, seems to me to be irrelevant. It seems to me to be very relevant because those are your clear needs. And while the 200 Border Patrol officers, the spots for 200, bo the uh, allotment for 200 Border Patrol officers may have gone through, perhaps other things didn't. How many cars didn't come through? How much, how much request for uh, new modern telecommunications equipment did not come through? Uh, what requests of yours were denied higher up that never got to Congress? That's my request. I don't control that decision. That's going to be up to DOJ and OMB. So, uh, gentlemen, gentlemen would yield here. This this is not a witch hunt or something to put somebody on the hot seat. If we're going to accomplish what this oversight committee is designed to do by Congress, then we need to have the paper trail from the initiation of the request to the final request, which came to Congress. And if you can't play catch up with your vehicle obsolescence because you request something here and it turns out to be something there which doesn't represent a policy that's in the best interest of your agency that's the business of this oversight committee and that's why we're sitting here you made you presented and i think very compelling testimony about some of the uh, uh problems you've got i don't see how you cover the ground you cover in the vehicles and equipment uh, uh, that you've got, and, and you, you're obviously making, stretching equipment out uh, over long, um, giving it much longer life than most would. Um, I don't think you ought to have to operate under those conditions, but let's, what I want to do is try and identify where it is uh, that we, we can be doing better, uh, from a congressional standpoint and also from the administration standpoint. So. Um, Oh, um, Commissioner, I want to thank you, Chief. Uh, turn to Mr. Schiff for any questions you might have. No, I asked my questions before. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Just, just a refresher on this. Uh, rather than take time, we have some specific questions that we'd like to submit in writing, rather than to take the time of the of the panel. Yes, sir. Commissioner, Chief, uh, Chief. Chief. I'd just like to thank the committee and all the people who have testified so far in their support of, of us and our mission and what we're doing. It's, 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 it means a lot. We want to let you know we appreciate it. I want you to know you've got an, uh, an advocate uh, uh, in terms of Mr. McCandless educating the subcommittee on the problems of patrolling uh, a large, expansive border with few personnel. And um, I think everyone's becoming aware of uh, what kind of challenge you've got. So thank you very much. Uh, the next uh, witness, uh, next panel will be the Honorable Pat Birdsall, Mayor of the City of Temecula, California, accompanied by Temecula City Attorney, uh, and no stranger to uh, uh, this body, a former member of Congress, Jerry Patterson. Uh, Mayor? If you would, if you have no objections to being sworn, if you stand and raise your right hand. <laughs> You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. I do. Mayor, I'd just like to make a personal observation that uh, you can select no better attorney. Uh, um, <laughs> Congressman Patterson was very kind to me when I first came to Congress and, and uh, uh, taught me a lot, so I appreciate the chance to be back together with you again, Jerry. Um, your written statement in its entirety will be made a part of the record, and I would invite you to summarize or to respond uh, in any way you see fit. Okay, fine. 
Honorable Chairman and members of the Government Operations Committee Subcommittee on Government Information, Justice and Agriculture. My name is Patricia Birds and I am the Mayor of the City of Temecula, California. Our city was the site of the June 2nd, 1992 accident, which killed five residents, four of which were students at Temecula Valley High School, and one undocumented alien. This accident was caused by a high-speed pursuit undertaken by the Immigration and Naturalization Services Border Patrol agents. I appreciate this opportunity to speak to you today regarding the mission of the INS in urban areas, particularly their pursuit policies and their communication with other agencies. The City of Temecula supports the important mission of the INS, stopping the seemingly endless flow of illegal immigration into this country. <coughs> However, the City does have serious concerns with one of the methods by which the INS carries out that mission, namely the use of high-speed pursuits to stop individuals who are suspected of nothing more than immigration violations. I would like to begin by thanking the subcommittee for scheduling and holding this hearing today. I believe that the pressure added by these congressional hearings is in large part responsible for the modifications in the INS pursuit policy announced last Friday. However, while these modifications are a step in the right direction, the policy still does not adequately protect our citizens from the very real threat to their safety posed by high-speed chases. As is more fully set forth in the written comments I have submitted to this subcommittee, the City of Temecula is located in Southwest Riverside County and is divided by the Interstate 15 freeway. Interstate 15 is one of the only two major north-south highways connecting San Diego with Los Angeles and the rest of California. As such, Interstate 15 plays an important role in the immigration and naturalization services efforts to prevent illegal immigration into the United States. In 1934, the INS established the Temecula Border Patrol <coughs> checkpoint. The checkpoint is located just south of the present boundary of the city of Temecula. When the checkpoint was built, the Temecula area was a lightly populated rural community. Like much of Southern California, however, the population of Temecula has grown dramatically in recent years, giving the area a much more urban character. When I moved to Temecula in 1972, there were approximately 2,500 residents. Today, we have 35,000. Tragically, however, the pursuit policies of the INS have not changed and adapted to meet the changing needs of this community. The result is a policy which threatens the lives and personal safety of the very people law enforcement personnel, such as the INS, are sworn to protect the citizens of the city of Temecula and other communities throughout Southern California. This sad truth was tragically and graphically illustrated by the accident that occurred in my city on June 2, 1992. The events that led to the accident began early on the morning of June 2nd in San Ysidro, California, located approximately 80 miles south of Temecula, near the Mexican border, when undercover agents of the INS anti-smuggling unit began to follow a green Chevrolet Suburban suspected of carrying illegal aliens. Approximately one and a half hours after the undercover agents had followed the Suburban, the vehicles approached the Temecula checkpoint. To avoid the checkpoint, the Suburban exited Interstate 15 at Rainbow Canyon Road, which is located just south of the checkpoint. The Suburban re-entered the freeway just north of the checkpoint. This maneuver is typical of undocumented aliens attempting to avoid the checkpoint and is common to all of the serious accidents caused by the INS chases in Temecula in recent years. Before it could be intercepted by a marked Border Patrol vehicle from the Temecula checkpoint, the Suburban again exited the Interstate 15 freeway. Both the unmarked and the marked INS vehicles followed the Suburban off the freeway where the marked Border Patrol vehicle attempted to stop the Suburban with its emergency lights and siren. The Suburban went into the parking lot of a nearby shopping center, left the parking lot, and began traveling upon city streets. The marked Border Patrol vehicle chased in hot pursuit with the unmarked, uncovered via undercover vehicle following. The marked Border Patrol vehicle then suffered an electrical <coughs> failure, causing its lights, siren, and radio to fail. Despite this electrical failure, both the marked and unmarked INS vehicles continued to follow the Suburban 
as it sped over residential streets and through an elementary school zone while local residents commuted to work and drove their children to school. Although the Border Patrol agents insist that they were traveling only 35 to 40 miles per hour, they managed to follow the Suburban over hilly, curving roads and were only a short distance behind the Suburban when the accident occurred. Based upon the force of the impact of the accident, the Suburban was estimated to be traveling in excess of 66 miles per hour. The Suburban, still attempting to elude the pursuing INS agents, entered the intersection of Margarita and Rancho Vista Roads, adjacent to Temecula Valley High School, against a red light. At the same time, John Davis, a 40-year-old Temecula banker, entered the intersection on the green light. John was driving his 18-year-old Todd, son Todd, and 14-year-old Monisa Emilio to school. They never made it. At approximately 7.40, the Suburban slammed into the Acura John was driving, ripping the Acura in half. Todd and Monisa were thrown from the car by the sheer force of the impact. John, Todd, and Monissa were all pronounced dead at the scene. After smashing through John's Acura, the Suburban flipped over on its side and slid through the intersection and onto the sidewalk adjacent to the high school. Also on the sidewalk, sidewalk were 17-year-old Gloria Murillo and her 16-year-old brother Jose, who were walking to school. They were struck and killed by the Suburban when its slide carried it onto the sidewalk. Jose and Gloria's mother, a reporter for a local newspaper, learned of her children's death when she arrived on the scene to cover the accident for her paper. Several other students who were also on their way to morning classes witnessed the gruesome accident and scores of others already in early classes witnessed the immediate aftermath of the accident. Our high school students were so distraught over what they saw and heard and the loss that they suffered that emergency counseling services had to be provided. Over 600 students received counseling services in the three days immediately following the accident. The 40 plus emergency personnel who were dispatched to the accident site also required counseling, which was provided by Riverside County Sheriff's Department chaplains. Ongoing counseling for many of these personnel is being provided by Sheriff Department sponsored occupational health services. As tragic as this accident was, it was only the most recent in a long line of serious accidents resulting from high-speed INS pursuits. On February 6, 1990, a 32-year-old Temecula resident and her unborn child were killed when the car she was riding in was struck by a vehicle being pursued by the INS in a high-speed chase. Her husband and 16-month-old son were injured in the crash. Another Temecula resident, Ray Simo, was permanently disabled when his car was, car was struck during a chase by Border Patrol agents on March 14, 1989. Like the June 2nd tragedy, these chases all began on Rainbow Canyon Road, the mountain highway smugglers used to evade the Temecula checkpoint. The Border Patrol has refused to release data on the number of high-speed pursuits which have resulted in death or injury. However, an independent investigation by reporters from the Orange County Register recently revealed that at least 35 people have been killed and at least 225 injured in accidents caused by INS high-speed pursuits in Southern California in the last 10 years alone. This carnage on our public streets and highways must stop. The INS must be made to follow a pursuit policy which properly balances whatever benefits might be realized by apprehending individuals suspected of violating the law against the very real threat to the public safety posed by high-speed pursuits. Experts, including those retained by the National Institute of Justice, agree that it is time to recognize high-speed pursuits for what they are, a use of potentially deadly force which threatens the lives and safety of every person using our public roads. Consequently, it is time to ask some very fundamental questions about the purpose of high-speed pursuits and their continued importance in our society, particularly in urban areas. The new pursuit policy proposed by the INS addresses some, but not all, of the criteria the National Institute of Justice has identified. The new INS policy still needs these specific improvements. First, the policy states that the risk a suspect poses must be greater than the risk 
a pursuit would pose to the public before a pursuit is undertaken. The policy must go further. It must specify that individuals who are merely suspected of committing immigration violations, which are generally treated as misdemeanors or minor felonies by the courts, do not pose a substantial or immediate threat to the public safety and must therefore not be pursued at high speeds. The policy must draw the line and provide that the public safety be risked only to stop known dangerous criminals who cannot be comprehended, apprehended in any other way. Border Patrol agents must be told they can no longer risk the public safety by chasing individuals suspected of nothing more than simple immigration violations through our streets at high speeds. Second, the new policy still does not require that Border Patrol agents objectively consider the time of day, road conditions, the neighborhoods they are traveling through, and other factors which impact the safety of a pursuit. Absent a written policy which requires Border Patrol agents to consider factors such as these, unnecessary and extremely dangerous high-speed pursuits will continue to be undertaken on our public streets, exposing each and every one of us to substantial risk of death or great bodily harm. Third, it makes no sense to have one pursuit policy applying from San Diego, California to Brownsville, Texas. There should be two policies, one for urban areas like Southern California and another for rural regions. Fourth, while the Border Patrol decision to coordinate and communicate with local law enforcement must be applauded, its reliable on reliance on local government to provide air surveillance is badly misplaced. To the contrary, Senator John Seymour from California had it right when he amended legislation last Monday to require the INS to station helicopters at its checkpoints. Finally, it is not enough to merely revise the pursuit policy. The operation of both the Temecula checkpoint on Interstate 15 and the San Clemente checkpoint on Interstate 5 must be re-examined. For example, as illustrated by Exhibit A to our written testimony, smugglers routinely use Rainbow Canyon Road to evade the Temecula checkpoint. This road leads the smugglers with the Pat Border Patrol in hot pursuit directly into Old Town Temecula. The checkpoint needs to be relocated to eliminate this problem. In closing, I would like to say that often when we are re removed from the immediate impact of a problem, we tend to view things from a statistical standpoint. When we are not personally involved, it is easy to present the statistics in such a way as to make a potential risk seem acceptable, as United States District Court Judge Alice Marie Stotler did when she commented that there had been only eight deaths caused by the INS in Temecula in the past two and a half years. However, when you are the public official who has to face constituents who have lost husbands and wives, brothers and sisters, schoolmates and friends, to an outdated and completely unnecessary government policy, you realize that sometimes you have to stand up and say that it is inappropriate to characterize the human devastation caused by that policy as an acceptable risk. We must realize and publicly acknowledge that there are some risks which simply can never be deemed acceptable. Mr. Chairman, members of this subcommittee, continuing to risk the lives of our husbands and wives our mothers, fathers, and our future, our children, in high-speed pursuits by Border Patrol agents chasing people suspected of nothing more than simple immigration violations and who pose no immediate threat to our citizenry is unacceptable. This unacceptable risk must stop. We must have a national policy that works. We must have a border policy that does not transfer the problem 50 to 100 miles north to Temecula and other communities. The INS must be forced to follow through on their public commitment to amend their pursuit policy. They must be made to adopt a comprehensive and effective policy which is sensitive to the needs of local communities. And they must realize that under a policy which properly balances the public safety against the need for high-speed pursuits, very few high-speed pursuits should be undertaken. The INS simply does not encounter suspects that often who pose a serious and immediate danger to the public. In addition, it is most important that there be an open line of communication between federal, state, county, and city agency. This is, a criti this is critical as our local police are most familiar with our city's demographics. 
I would like to thank you for allowing me to testify before you today, and I urge you to take whatever action is necessary to ensure that the lives and safety of our citizens are no longer threatened unnecessarily. I would also like to urge that each member of this subcommittee support H.R. 4429, the Pursuit Awareness Act of 1992, introduced by Congressman Dorgan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mr. Patterson, did you have any remarks? Um, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, I, I have no uh, remarks uh, other than we, uh, we have uh, no prepared remarks. We do have, uh, we have had an opportunity to hear the testimony uh, this morning, and I think we want to make it uh, very clear that the city of Temecula strongly supports the Border Patrol. We strongly support their mission. Uh, we think that the Im illegal immigration, however, should be stopped at its border. Uh, our our uh, difficulty with the Border Patrol rests in the how high-speed pursuits are handled. Uh, the new subsection 3C, which uh, the commissioner uh, indicated uh, that uh, this regarding the balancing test of human life uh, versus uh, the advantage of um, catching the uh, suspect, uh, we think is a good good policy and a step in the right direction. Our fear and our concern at this time is until the operating uh, instructions, I believe they call them, are out on the table, uh, it's, it's impossible to say that the policy would work. The um, Escondido San Diego County Regional Pursuit Policy is uh, at least eight pages long and has an impl implementation policy uh, following it. Uh, I think our our hope is that through congressional oversight and through a reexamination of its own policies that the Border Patrol uh, will establish an implementation procedure or operating instructions so not just the chiefs behind me, the 15 chiefs behind me, but that every officer out in the field knows exactly what they should or should not do in regard to high-speed pursuits. Uh, we all know one gets carried away at times uh, uh, perhaps uh, chasing someone, and there needs to be uh, uh, something that works. I think the uh, mandatory uh, discussions with uh, a supervisor so that the supervisor can terminate uh, the chase is a good step forward. So we're seeing some things today in this hearing uh, accomplished that we uh, think are, are very, very helpful. As a matter of fact, next week another congressional uh, uh, subcommittee will be uh, evaluating some of the Border Patrol's missions, we hope to be able to testify there and, and to be able to say to them uh, that we are with the Border Patrol for more funding, more staffing, better training, so they can accomplish their basic mission. So again, our difference with them is strictly on the high-speed pursuit policy, and we think it really needs to be changed, and we hope that you look into the operating instructions. We don't think it ought to be negotiable with the union or anyone else as to whether or not uh, high-speed chases uh, that endanger the officers in, in, the, in the vehicle as well as suspects, as well as the public at large, uh, should, should be uh, uh, something negotiable. I mean, it's, if it's endangering life and limb and property, then it shouldn't be done. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. McCallis? Mayor, we've talked about uh citizens group working with uh, the Border Patrol and communities where the Border Patrol has the presence that it does in Temecula and other locations. Would you share with me your perception of how that would move forward and what, what would be the objectives and goals of that kind of, a, of an organization from the city's point of view? Well, we uh, at the present time do not have that type of an organization. It has been suggested that we get one. I think that you would open lines of communications between the two agencies and uh, hopefully uh, be able to know ahead of time some of the problems that they might be addressing or that our people are addressing. I do know that since the accident on June 2nd, there have been two or three instances in our community where the Border Patrol and our City Police Department have worked together in joint pursuit and arrest. Uh, regarding drug people, and I'm not sure of particulars on the other uh, instances other than I do know that it did happen. I think that uh, that type of committee might uh, be very, very successful. 
in, in uh, being able to have communication lines between the different agencies. As you're well aware, we're a fairly new city. We've only been in existence since December 1st of 1989. So we're still trying to learn all of the <coughs> ropes and, and how to do all these things. And I think that now that Murrieta is a city uh, next to us, that these things can be accomplished and possibly a joint effort between other cities in the Temecula Valley would make this a working relationship. Their offices are in our city. Um, the Border Patrol checks point at this point is outside the li city limits. In fact, it, where they have moved it to now, it's actually in San Diego County. It's right across the county line. It's not even in Riverside County. Um, and again, one of the, our biggest issues on that is, is getting the communication line open. And I think a, a, a submitti committee, there is groups in the city right now uh, that have been up in arms since this accident happened that I think would be willing to work in a group effort to try to get the understandings resolved. But help me out when you talk about understanding and, and uh, the, uh, the community separate from that of the law enforcement mutual aid or or helpful response what what could the uh, the committee or the community do here in this kind of scenario that we're talking about what what activities would they participate in well i think they would participate in a communication line between the citizenry and law enforcement i think that um had there been this type of a uh, group established prior to this accident, they would have been able to get their information and get their <coughs> facts and not be so up in arms against the Border Patrol. Initially, when this accident happened, the citizenry was very definitely up in arms against our Border Patrol and the INS in its entirety. I think that has now come down, if you want to call it off a high, to a point where they're understanding better. We as as city people leaders in our community certainly understand that they are another law enforcement agency and have to be respected for the job they do. Uh, I go back in Temecula long enough to know that INS at one time was our only, our only police. We had nothing else. And for a very long time, we had one sheriff that covered 500 square miles and we used the INS. There was a communication line open at that time. It has since been lost. Uh, I think that by having a citizen's organization, you could open that line and address the issues of, of why do they do certain things. In other words, one of their complaints right now from the citizenry is that the Rainbow Canyon Road cut off. The Border Patrol people sit there in a diagonal position, and each time a car goes by, they turn the headlights on them. In, right now, there's no answer to why that's being done uh, and if we had a committee from the citizenry that could sit down with them and try to determine why are they doing it and is it a hazard? And if it is, then let's address that issue. So those would be some of the things that I would see a committee like that do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. I'm following up on that, Mayor. Um, at this point, is there any, is there direct communication when I say direct communication, I don't mean radio communication. I mean talking back and forth over matters of policy, matters of procedure between the city of Temecula, the police department, and the border patrol, the designated representatives that communicate with each other on a regular basis. No, at this point they have not on a regular basis. Since this accident, they have met a couple of times, and I think in the future that's going to be an established policy between our police chief and uh, the representatives from the San Diego office and also Mr. Barbeau, who is in charge of our local office. How many officers would be on the Temecula Police Department? I think we have 28. The, um, so they've got a lot of ground to cover, too. Yes, uh -huh. yeah. yeah. We have 26 square miles of actual mm -hmm. city limits. If I find my name is Chairman, it's one of the unique things about Riverside County. They contract with the Sheriff's Department. So there is an automatic backup in the unincorporated area if it's needed, which goes beyond the contract that the city has with uh, the sheriff's department. But are these officers within the city boundaries of Temecula, are they sheriff's deputies? or are Okay, they let me explain to you what it is. We have a contract with the County of Riverside Sheriff's Department. At the time we established that this is what we were going to do, 
they brought to us men from their staff to be interviewed for our police chief. We picked one of those men. He became our police chief. He then <coughs> handpicked every man that's in our police department today. They are paid by the County of Riverside Sheriff's Department. They wear our patches. They drive cars that say City of Temecula with our city seal on them. So they are considered our city police department. Now there are backup in the county facilities that are a cost factor to us, and this is one reason we went with this type of a procedure, that if they needed a helicopter or if this sort of backup was needed, they could use it. We're on a regular network for our 911 services and all of that. And so we have that backup capability by being under contract with the County of Riverside. Is, is, it, is it desirable uh, for Temecula and the police department to have um, uh, direct radio communication with the Border Patrol? I think so, yes. In fact, my understanding from my police chief uh, Monday morning before I left was that since the policy was uh, put out in a press release Friday <coughs> afternoon at approximately 4.30 from the INS, he has had a call uh, Monday morning from Mr. Barbeau, who is in charge of our station, and they are I attempting to implement a line of communication between our city police department and the Border Patrol station in our city. And your city police department, since it is under a form of contract with the sheriff's department, does it have direct radio communication with the sheriff's department? Yes, it does. Yes, it does at this point. It does not have it with the highway patrol, and it does not have it with any federal agency at the present time. Uh, but, but if you tie in to your police department, then in effect you're tied into the sheriff's department. Exactly. Yes, there is a line of communication open there. Yes. Um, the, uh, I think that your statement uh, illustrates, uh, well, I think some of the concerns you have with the present policy or the policy that was in effect and it looks as though there's a new one um, under consideration now and we'll see see what happens there. Um, this concept of uh, mutual aid which isn't just something that's a problem with the federal agencies of the Border Patrol. I mean in the, my own state we've got uh, deputies that can't in a rural county that can't talk to the urban, to the city police, that can't speak to the highway, can't communicate directly with the highway patrol. Um, and it's, it's something it seems to me that we, uh, we need to address in this country and perhaps uh, that's something that could be assisted through local, like National Institute of Justice or one of the other Justice Department agencies and that's something we could, could look at. Um, Mr. Schiff, do you have any? Uh, just very briefly, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mayor, I, I heard your complete statement, but had to leave the room for just a couple minutes during questioning, and, and forgive me if I'm asking something that one of my colleagues asked. I have just two things I want to ask about. The first is, I, I hate to dwell on the gr a great tragedy that uh, happened in your community that you testified about, particularly because we, we understand the Border Patrol is working on its overall policy in this area. But I, I have to ask you because, about it because I believe that your testimony contradicts, as I heard it, the testimony of uh, Mr. McNary uh, testifying on behalf of the INS. Uh, he stated that at the time of this tragedy, there was no pursuit in progress. These are individuals who perhaps thought they were going to be pursued, uh, but were traveling through your community at this uh, ultra-high rate of speed on their own uh, and not being chased. Um, can you, can you uh, tell me a little bit more about, about which version might be correct there? Well. I can only tell you from citizenry that I spoke to that witnessed the different parts of the transaction that happened, which was took less than, if I'm determining right, approximately three minutes from the time they left the freeway the second time entering our residential areas before the accident happened. Um, I have not seen our full police report, which is what will be transacting. What's happened is the County of Riverside District Attorney's Office has put a gag order on that police report, so mm -hmm. it cannot be made public because of the murder charges involved in it. I do know this, I've spoken with numerous people. There was, to my knowledge, a pursuit in progress coming off the freeway after they had, they had come back on the freeway at 79 South. The next off-ramp is Rancho California Road, <coughs> which goes right into the center of our city. 
when they were coming off of that, they were being pursued with the lights and sirens going from an INS marked vehicle that had come on from the checkpoint. The initial vehicle that was following them that was the undercover vehicle from the border itself in San Ysidro was not pursuing it, was simply following it. There are some statistics and some figures and information. I don't have them available with me, but they, they went off the freeway, they bought gas, they stopped at a AM, PM, they got food, and at no point was an attempt made to, to you know, arrest these people. They got back on the freeway, taking approximately a mile and a half from the time they left the San Ysidro checkpoint before they were actually pursued by a marked vehicle. And they pursued them off the freeway. They pursued them into the shopping area. They pursued them when the, the car came out and went across the uh, media in the wrong direction and then turned left onto Inez and then onto Rancho Vista. It was my understanding that at the <coughs> point where it turned left onto Rancho Vista is when their lights and sirens broke uh, just before the elementary school. And that is when the pursuit was stopped. And that they, was, excuse me, Mayor, but that would yeah. have been how far from the scene of the accident? Approximately three quarters of a mile. Thank you, Mayor. May I, may I ask about one other matter? I'm trying to uh, get the geography straight. The turnoff that is south of the uh, Border Patrol checkpoint, is that a normal turnoff that citizens would norm one of one of more than one, I suspect, but a normal turnoff that citizens would use to enter your community? No, it is not. It's a normal turnoff for citizens to enter a community called Rainbow that has a population of about 1,000 people. What it does do is it runs a parallel road to the Interstate 15 that comes back up and enters at 79 South, which is in our city limits. Right. So it, it connects, goes through two communities, in other words. Right. Yes. Is there a, uh, the, the point, however, I was getting at uh, uh, is the same. There's a way around the checkpoint that leads people through not only your community, but another community. Yes. Is there a place uh, either further south or further north to a reasonable degree that would, uh, that would not provide as easy a means to get off the uh, interstate to avoid the checkpoint where the Border Patrol might be able to relocate a checkpoint and have less people going through uh, There is communities? just north of, of Highway 76, which is approximately, I would say, eight miles south of where the, maybe not even eight miles, maybe six miles south of where the Border Patrol's checkpoint sets at this point, okay. right now, today. Thank you very much, Mayor and Congressman. Thank you for being here. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mayor, I also thank you and would just ask if in closing you or Mr. Patterson would have any additional comments you'd like to make. No, I can't think of uh, Congressman Schiff, perhaps uh, pages four through seven of the written testimony are pretty well verified through uh, police uh, review as to what happened in the, as far as the Temecula Police Department and uh, eyewitness observers have noted to us. Mr. Patterson, that, that does bring up a good uh, question is, in the testimony that's been presented, or Mayor, in the testimony that's been presented, is that from uh, the observations of the Temecula Police Department? Is it information that you have independently gathered uh, from talking to citizens? Um, no, it's from our city police department. They did a full investigation. Is it, do you anticipate that at some point that report would be released? We're trying to find out right now. In fact, we just called back there earlier today to see if we can release it to you folks. Because of the court order, we're having to make a determination whether that can be done or not. And I'm sure that at some point it will be able to be released. I'm just not sure at what point, and we are trying to get that information for you. And hopefully, because my understanding is that this will be open for at least another week or so, that we could get that be to open you. Probably, yeah. we'll, we'll keep the record open for probably up to 30 days, okay. so any additional Well, we're in hopes material. that we'll be able to get that full report to you. And in keeping with um, what I've asked other witnesses is uh, I anticipate having some written questions uh, that I'd like to submit to you and would just ask if you would be willing to submit them, um, return, respond to them in writing, and we'll also include those as part of the testimony. No yes. problem at Absolutely. all. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. We'd like to thank Congressman Candless who yes. assisted us greatly in this, uh, in the hearing and in uh, meeting with us in this regard too. Con Congressman McCandless is the one who's 
brought this to the attention of uh, the subcommittee and, and been uh, uh, pursuing it very, very aggressively. And, and I appreciate uh, that observation. I appreciate what he's done on this. Thank um, you. Mayor, thank we you thank you very much. much for the efforts you've made to be here, Mr. Patterson. Jerry, always good to see you again. Thank you. Thank you again, Mr. Weiss. Our final panel um, will be T.J. Bonner, president of the National Border Patrol Council. He will be accompanied by Agent Ralph Bubel, uh, Temecula Border Patrol Station Steward, uh, Chief Wetzel of the Choctaw, Oklahoma Police and International Association of Chiefs of Police have, has already testified. And Dr. in the second witness then will be Dr. Jeffrey Alpert, College of Criminal Justice, University of South Carolina. Gentlemen, as you've seen from the previous panel, it's the practice of subcommittee to swear in all witnesses so as not to prejudice any witness who may come before it. Would you stand and raise your right hand? You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Mr. Bonner, uh, I would invite you to, to begin. And let me just say to the panel, I appreciate your patience. It's been a long, uh, long hearing, but a very important one. Your written statements in their entirety are already made a part of the record, uh, so will be considered by the subcommittee. I would invite you to uh, summarize, but also perhaps you, the one benefit to sitting through everybody else is that you've heard what everybody else has to say and that you can respond perhaps to some things that you think are, are particularly relevant, and I would encourage, uh, encourage that. As I say, what you brought with you in writing is already made a part of the committee record, and I've already read it. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to address the important topic that is being considered today. The National Border Patrol Council of the American Federation of Government Employees, AFL-CIO, represents all non-supervisory Border Patrol agents and support personnel. We wish to express our deepest sympathy to all of those who are affected by the tragedy in Temecula. It also deeply affected many of our people. We understand the grief, but we wish to make it clear that this tragedy is something which would not have been prevented by this new pursuit policy. It would not be prevented by any pursuit policy because the Border Patrol was not pursuing that vehicle. And that is one of the key points we wish to make, is that once a vehicle decides to flee, there is currently nothing that we can do about it. Nothing under the current policy, nothing under the proposed policy. They are totally out of our control. The Border Patrol Council is deeply concerned about the growing number of criminals including alien and narcotic smugglers who are endangering the safety of the motoring public and the public at large by recklessly using motor vehicles to flee from law enforcement officers. This is the crux of the issue here. We're not talking so much about vehicle pursuits but fleeing felons. And unfortunately, there are no current laws making it a felony to recklessly drive away from a federal law enforcement officers and many state and local jurisdictions have no laws in that regard. Law enforcement officers are powerless to stop vehicles from fleeing. If by chance they apprehend a vehicle, federal judges are unable to punish the offenders for their willful endangerment of the public safety. Through inaction, our system has inadvertently fostered this dangerous practice. The solution to the problem is obvious. Strict legislation must be enacted to discourage individuals from engaging in such behavior. The administrative response of the Immigration and Naturalization Service, a revision of its vehicle pursuit policy, is viewed by the National Border Patrol Council as unrealistic, ineffectual, and even counterproductive. Despite media reports and assurances to the contrary from the INS, the National Border Patrol Council has never been consulted about the revision, nor has it received a copy of the policy from the INS. I obtained a copy of the policy from an outside source yesterday, and that was the first time I had seen the policy. I'm pleased to hear that the INS is willing to bargain over the impact and implementation of this policy, but remain concerned that the INS 
feels that they have the right to implement the policy at this point in time. With your permission, to change the critical item. Uh, Mr. Bonner, <clears throat> if such a document were provided your organization, where would it be delivered? What address would be used? Uh, it would order? be delivered to my home office address. I was there until... Uh, I'm, I'm talking... Where, where do you live? In Campo, California. It's in San Diego County. All right. Now, you are the representative of the West Coast? Area. I am the president of the National Border Patrol Council. I am the right. president so of the organization. All, all documents dealing with uh, labor negotiations, changes of policy, and so forth affecting your members come to your home? That is correct. Do you have a secretary there? Or people answer the phone, or is it uh, informal? It's informal. I have an answering machine that picks up all messages when I am not there. I have a fax machine that's on 24 hours a day. They are well aware of that. They have faxed me bargaining correspondence okay. in the past. So if, if I'm a, am I a member of your organization and I happen to be stationed in Florida and I wanted to uh, uh, bring something forward for purposes of review by your organization, I would contact you then at this location. I'm not sure that I, if you were a member I'm of the... I'm a member, I'm a Border Patrol member of your organization. Okay. I'm stationed in, in Florida. Just for purposes of our discussion. Okay. And uh, I wanted to discuss with my representative a problem of what I consider to be serious magnitude. Then I would contact you in California. Does that, does that my understanding of how it works? The normal chain of command for members to contact uh, a union officer for assistance is to go through their local first. We have 16 locals. Okay. If it can't be resolved at the local, it will be brought up to one of the regional vice presidents. If the regional vice president cannot resolve it, it comes to my attention. But anything like this would go directly to you? Yes. Anything like this meaning what it is we're talking about here in the way of a change of proposed... Uh, Policy. That is correct. Everything right. that the agency, every bargaining notification from the agency that impacts on a national level comes to my attention right. directly. Thank you. It appears that the union has been placed into the role of being the bad guy in this, that we'd have this wonderful policy were it not for this obligation to bargain with the union. I wish to make it clear that the union is very supportive of all positive changes in working conditions and anything which enhances officer safety and the safety of the public is viewed favorably by the union and we will do everything to expedite implementation of those types of things. However, we do have a few concerns over the impact of the proposed policy as it currently stands. The revised policy appears to allow vehicle pursuits only in cases where an officer has knowledge of the commission of a felony or misdemeanor crime by the driver of a vehicle. More often than not, fleeing suspects are just that, suspects. The courts have consistently affirmed the right of law enforcement officers to question individuals based upon probable cause and reasonable suspicion. Not allowing officers to pursue a fleeing vehicle that is endangering the public safety because they do not have knowledge of a separate crime would be irresponsible on the part of the INS. The revised policy also requires that communications personnel be advised of the initiation of a vehicle pursuit. This is not possible in all cases because of the inferior communications systems and equipment utilized by the Border Patrol. There are numerous lo locations throughout the normal areas of Border Patrol operations where radio communications are impossible. Furthermore, the procedure outlined in the revised policy requires communications personnel to notify a supervisor and state and local law enforcement agencies and to transmit essential information to them concerning the vehicle pursuit. Supervisors utilize the same radio frequencies as <coughs> communications personnel and should be able to monitor the transmissions from the pursuing officers, eliminating unnecessary duplication of information that would waste time and prevent the officers engaged in the pursuit from using the radio frequency to transmit updated information. Despite the limitations in the communications process, 
supervisors who are not involved in the pursuit under the revised policy would be responsible to monitor and control the operation and would be allowed to terminate the pursuit at any time. This provision is impractical because the involved officers are the only ones in a position to observe the actions and reactions of the driver of the fleeing car, the traffic and road conditions, and a host of other factors that impact upon the decision of whether or not to pursue a vehicle. They're also able to continually process and evaluate all relevant factors almost instantaneously. <clears throat> Due to the structure of the revised policy, as well as limitations of speech and radio communications, there would be a substantial <clears throat> delay in the receipt of essential information by a supervisor. Border Patrol agents receive excellent training in pursuit policy and driving tactics. There is no evidence that this discretion has been abused in the past. An effective vehicle pursuit policy must allow the officers at the scene to exercise discretion, consistent with a well-written, well-reasoned policy. Additionally, the revised policy would prohibit officers from using any type of force to halt a fleeing vehicle, regardless of the circumstances. There are times when the safety of the public demands that affirmative action be taken to stop a vehicle. There are a number of methods to achieve this goal without unduly endangering the public. Without the availability of this option, even the finest legislation would be rendered ineffective. In sum, the serious threat to public safety posed by irresponsible drivers <coughs> who use motor vehicles in attempts to flee from law enforcement officers must be dealt with swiftly and firmly. Statutes mandating harsh <coughs> prison sentences for this offense must be enacted, and law enforcement officers must be granted the flexibility to employ sound judgment in conducting vehicle pursuits <coughs> in order to effectively enforce the law and protect the public. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bonner. Uh, Mr. Bubell, and my first question is, am I pronouncing your name correctly? It's close enough. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, did you have anything you wish to add? No, sir, I'm just here to answer any questions about the Temecula Station that you might have. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Alpert. Thank you, sir. It's an honor to be here today to address you, Mr. Chairman, and members of the committee. Uh, I congratulate you on your decision to take a critical look at this extremely controversial and danger dangerous tactic of law enforcement. I've spent more than 10 years studying police pursuit, training officers, and writing policies. I'm pleased to provide this committee with information concerning the assessment of pursuit driving, and I want to say that a lot of the testimony we've heard here today would mirror some of my comments, so I want to skip over my written comments and and, and jump into some issues that, uh, that I think should be covered um, outside what's been said. I've heard some very interesting and I think progressive comments on the need for policing smarter, for doing things without um, unlimited resources, for doing things with the problems we all have today. Uh, some comments made by the Border Patrol and INS representatives uh, to look for alternatives. And I think the term policing smarter or smarter policing is very important in this issue. It's a need to balance the enforcement of laws and public safety. And I think that I want to touch on those issues in my comments today. I think it's very important to understand some parameters of pursuit, and it's been my opinion for uh, a number of years that it is not the law enforcement officer who initiates a pursuit. I think it's important in t not just semantics, but in terms of the process of what goes on. I think it's uh, the officer who initiates a traffic, an investigatory, or a felony stop by the use of emergency equipment signaling someone to pull over. It's the decision of that person. Uh, most of us will stop, obviously. It is the odd person, literally, who does not stop. And, and I think at that point, um, while it's not the officer who initiates the pursuit, the environment changes significantly from one that is a normal traffic or, or investigatory stop to a very dangerous situation in which the officer has to make some very quick decisions. Uh, I think it's important to, to reemphasize that it is not the officer who initiates the pursuit, but it is the officer who has to make some, some very important decisions. Um, when the environment changes from a normal driving condition to one uh, of potentially deadly force and risk to the officer's safety and risk to the public, then we have to rely on our policies and our training to respond. Uh, I think the likelihood of an accident increases dramatically as this environment changes. 
similarly, uh, if, if a suspect has been driving erratically and the officer's intervention creates no difference in that driving, then I don't see why should we should be blaming the actions of the officer. If the, if the suspect has been driving in a normal situation and then increases his recklessness or, or speed or whatever risk to the public, then we have to be very careful uh, because the officer's action has influenced the driving of the suspect. The analogy of the use of firearms. Now, I've done quite a bit of work on that, and I would like to read into the record something from California Post, California uh, Police Officer Standards and Training. And I'll quote uh, Learning Goal 6.1.0. We tend to think of a car as a means of transportation, which it is. But stop and think of this for a moment. A 44 Magnum revolver with a 240 grain bullet develops about 1,400 foot-pounds of energy at a muscle velocity of approximately 1,600 feet per second, certainly a deadly weapon. Now consider an average automobile weighing 4,000 pounds, traveling down a street at 35 miles an hour, which translates to 52.5 feet per second. It's developing 171,163 foot-pounds of energy. You would better believe it as a deadly weapon, deadly weapon for others as well <coughs> as you. So I think it's become well um, accepted that pursuit driving uh, is a potential deadly weapon. And I think the California training goal is one that, that uh, gives us a, a good entree into that. I also want to point out that prior to the Supreme Court decision in Garner v. Tennessee, when police officers were allowed to shoot fleeing felons, um, th there was a lot of controversy among the law enforcement community and, and the uh, public safety community whether or not this is a, a, how the court should rule on this. A lot of uh, briefs filed. The concern was that if all, that a fleeing felons could not be stopped by using a firearm, then all felons would flee. And I think in the last few years we've seen that uh, an enormous number of, of uh, shootings have been avoided with this kind of, of restrictive policy handed down by the court. And I think it's been a very good decision in, in um, restricting police use of deadly force by firearms. I also want to go on the record as saying I would no more take pursuit away from the police than I would suggest you take their firearms away. But in each case, it has to be controlled by policy, training, and a good, strong mission statement. Unfortunately, in pursuit, uh, there's no middle ground. We've heard testimony, and I, I have no knowledge of the facts of, of this particular situation, but we've heard testimony um, whether it was or wasn't a pursuit. Um, the point that I want to make, and I think uh, Mr. Bonner made it earlier, is if the suspect decides to take off, there is nothing a law enforcement officer can do short of deadly force. Uh, the case that was mentioned earlier in Texas where they went for 70 some miles and the, the Texas uh, Department of Public Safety shot his tires out, I mean that's a, a good shot, probably a lucky shot. And we've <coughs> seen situations where they've tried to do that and it hasn't worked. Um, there is nothing law enforcement can do short of deadly force. So I think the search for alternatives, the smarter policing, is, is where we need to go. Now, the key in pursuit driving is something we've heard also testified to in this hearing, and that is the need to balance risk created by the driving with the need to immediately apprehend the suspect. The risk created by the pursuit can be defined by the likelihood or probability of an accident based on factors such as road conditions, uh, traffic, likelihood of, of traffic, the type of car, type of road, a whole variety of things that the International Association of Chiefs of Police has, has enumerated very well. Um, also to be included in that analysis is the likelihood of apprehension. Is this person going to stop, short of uh, crashing, for example? Is there a likelihood of, of actual apprehension? If there is no likelihood of apprehension, why do we continue to raise the risks? And I think that needs to be put in there. Um, the need to immediately apprehend the, sus the suspect refers to the danger posed by the suspect if he is not detained. And I think the suggested policy covers that very well, that we've heard testimony on today. And I think that's a very important part of, of, of the pursuit policy. Uh, if the uh, Law enforcement officer uh, identifies a mass murderer, a rapist, or, or, or someone of that magnitude uh, likely to commit another violent crime, then certainly the need to ap immediately apprehend that person is significant. On the other hand, if the police observe a safety violation, such as a speeding vehicle, or one which has run a stop sign, or a motorcyclist without a helmet, um, <coughs> the need to apprehend that law violator is, is inconsequential. It's the need to remove the unsafe behavior that's important. 
And the way to remove the unsafe behavior may be just to back off. That's a very difficult thing for most law enforcement officers to understand in the International Association of Chiefs of Police issues and, and um, concept paper on the pursuit policy, they have a paragraph in there explaining that their new restrictive model policy is a very difficult thing for a lot of law enforcement officers to, to understand, that we've got to enforce laws absolutely, but not at the risk of public safety. Uh, I, I think as there is certainly a need to analyze the police use of firearms and, and, and certainly we have very strong policies and, and recommendations uh, to do that, there is a need to analyze pursuit driving in not just the individual case to determine whether it was within policy or followed was within, the, within the law, but also in the aggregate to see what the outcomes are. What, in, my, in my opinion, uh, a negative outcome of a pursuit is not going to determine if it's a good or bad pursuit. It's the process by which that pursuit followed, it, if it was within the guidelines, if it was within the policy. The outcome is an act of God many times. I think it's um, very important to understand that pursuit driving is a highly emotional event and that the, uh, that the officer involved can be influenced by adrenaline, by a, a need to win, by just a competitive nature. And I think that's why the, the importance of the supervisor must be underscored, that someone who is detached, who can make responsible decisions not being influenced by the heat of the chase. And I think that's a, that's a significant uh, a part of the policy. Uh, a detached supervisor can take charge by radio contact. I think it's deplorable that our law enforcement officers are in a situation where they don't have contact. I, I know the problem of dead spots, and I know that there is technology. It is a matter of money. But without communication, there should be no chase. There are basically three types of policies. Uh, there are judgmental policies, restrictive, and discouragement policies. Uh, we've heard testimony uh, about several today. Certainly the judgmental that leaves the officers to make all decisions relating to tactics and termination is one without, uh, without very strong reasoning and very strong uh, situations such as the, the demography of the area and, and, the, and the type of uh, roads is one that's mired in the past certainly for urban areas. A restrictive policies will place certain restrictions on officers, including the type of offense or tactics, and a discouragement policy will severely caution or discourage any pursuit except in the most extreme situation. Those with judgmental policies uh, with only broad guidelines require enormous amounts of training and definition of each type of, of, of word in that policy. I don't personally like those policies. Um, I think progressive departments operate under restrictive policies which limit the officer's discretion. And for example, Tampa, Florida recently restricted pursuits to known or suspected violent felons. The Florida Highway Patrol has an order that a pursuit uh, for a minor traffic offense be terminated when it continues for more than three miles or when the offender exits the freeway. Those are examples of restrictive kinds of policies and very important depending upon the area in which you are enforcing laws and protecting the public. Other kinds of, of restrictive policies include uh, issues when suspects go the wrong way down a one-way street, the risk may be unnecessary for the need to immediately apprehend the suspect. Uh, when driving erratically or dangerously, uh, it may not be worth uh, the safety of the public to continue such a pursuit. Discouragement policies, such as you have in Baltimore, uh, require air support and other kinds of, of uh, alternatives that we've heard about today, and, and that uh, that's seemed to have worked for them. There have been some strong influences on the development of these policies and training. Certainly the state legislatures... Uh, Dr. Abbott, let me stop you there for this reason. We're going to have to turn this committee room <coughs> over fairly shortly. And... Uh, You've given us a lot of meat to think on, to talk about, and I'd like to get to some questions if I could. As I say, your written statement is already made a part of the record. You won't even let me cite the, the fine court case from West well, Virginia. I, I, so it, it was so stellar <laughs> that... Uh, 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 Mr. McCandless, let me see if you have any questions. <clears throat> One of the things that uh, I'm going to say, Bubel, is that close? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Officer Bubel, uh, I'm reasonably familiar with the Temecula area. The pavement used to end there in 1936 on the way to Warner's Hot Springs. So, <clears throat> old 95 versus I-15 versus Rainbow Canyon Road. 
which is a complex of three units of travel all coming together, very, very difficult to screen at, at the location you are currently at, which has been pointed out, does add to the problem. A have you uh, reviewed that as the person responsible on site and made any recommendations or have any thoughts on how that <coughs> position may be changed to, to not only benefit the Border Patrol, but also to reduce what it is that we've had in the way of uh, problems? Um, my people in Temecula have, have never come to me to, to tell me that they thought that the positioning of Rainbow Canyon and O395 and I-15 were a problem. But for the proper operation of the checkpoint, we have to have vehicles that cover those secondary side roads. Because in Temecula, the majority of our illegal aliens and our drug smugglers are not caught right at the checkpoint. The checkpoint only funnels those people into, into areas where they can circumvent it. And that's where the majority of our activity takes place. So those roads have to be covered in, in one way or another, whether it's with a roving patrol unit, a vehicle parked on the road observing the, the cars as they go by, or whether it's with a, some kind of temporary checkpoint or something. Those areas have to be covered because the checkpoint is ineffective without those areas covered. I, I understand where you're coming from, and therein lies allegedly the problem as it's being uh, touted by or, or presented by other people, I should say, in that uh, this encourages those who are knowledgeable of the checkpoint to take the alternate route because there is an opportunity then to circumvent the checkpoint system and possibly be more successful in their quest to, to uh, proceed north without apprehension and that this sets up then or invites a set of circumstances where chases might be undertaken. Uh, what comment would you have toward that? And that problem is going to exist no matter where we, we locate our checkpoint. We can move the checkpoint south of where it's at now to, to the area indicated by Mayor Birdsall, but you're still going to have roads that can circumvent that, that location. Uh, does three, I, I am not familiar with the location that she was specifically talking about, but would uh, 395 still be open in addition to I-15 at the place that, uh, that she's uh, talking about? At that location, 395, uh, instead of being on the east side of the freeway, is on the west side of the freeway. And it would still be open for aliens and right. alien smugglers at, to at use. At the San Luis Ray, whatever that intersection is, they could turn off there and go along on the west side then. Right. Yes, sir. Um, Dr. Albert, Burn, one very quick one. Uh, you brought in the, what uh, you have referred to previously as just the human nature of the male animal and macho <coughs> sometimes it goes along with it under certain circumstances. Yes, sir. Um, you referred to police officer and uh, standard training post, which is uh, very familiar to me in California. Um, in that particular program and in other programs, do they address the idea psychologically in the basic training of officers that there is a point at which you could be taken over by this desire to accomplish or to succeed and that you have to be alert of this? Do they get into that at all? My understanding is, is that they do, sir. I understand in both the uh, specific pursuit training and also in officer survival training there's a, a large segment of, uh, I, well a segment anyway that has to do with preparation before an event in other words uh, tactical knowledge and information and yes part of that is the emotional stress and certainly the, the uh, um, adrenaline rush that could be a problem they teach in shooting situations myopic vision audio blockout this is going to occur similarly in pursuit driving these things uh, they happen and yes they do train to it thank you thank you uh, dr alpert um have you i believe well, let me ask you have you seen the proposed ins pursuit policy that's I've, been under considered talk under discussion today i've seen it i've not studied it i've, I've read it briefly yes okay, i just wonder if you'd had any uh, it formed any opinions on it uh at this time it, it looks as, it, as though it has all the elements, and I agree with Chief Wetzel that it certainly would fit. It, it is much closer to the, I, the IACP model than, than uh, previous. And 
The previous witness, you had three categories of policies. The previous witness, I think, uh, uh, had discretionary and restrictive, and you had uh, judgmental. <laughs> Uh, restrictive, restrictive and, and discouragement. And, and discouragement. Yes. Where in your category, in your categorization, where would this, would the proposed policy fall? And definitely restrictive. Uh, and would you, do you, are you aware of what the previous INS policy was? Yes, sir. And where would you put that judgmental? Yes, sir. Have you been able to survey departments? Uh, is there any? Can you give any kind of uh, estimate as to <coughs> the uh, law enforcement agencies using? Uh, restrictive uh, versus judgmental versus uh, what was the third one? Uh, discouragement. Yeah, uh, sir. Well, part of the testimony I was hoping to get in, so I'll slip it oh, in. No, now. it's in, no, it's in already. <laughs> no, no, that I, that wasn't oh. written. Oh. Was the need for 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 research of that type? Uh, there's only one state in the country, and that's Minnesota, that has any statewide requirement for reporting uh, policies <coughs> or pursuits. Uh, to answer very quickly, there are no national statistics. Uh, there's a very great need for that, and not only in the uh, statistics and pursuits, but also the, uh, how many departments even have policies and what kind of policies they are. The, um, are you familiar by any chance with the policy of the California Highway Patrol? Yes, sir. Well, how would you categorize that? That fits it within the law that uh, uh, certainly they cannot be sued. I'm sorry, but... <laughs> the non-committal committal. It would, how would it be? Uh, I'm, I'm after, in the fourth hour, I get dense. Um, I was trying to slip one by you, sir. I didn't do a very good job. Yeah. Um, how would you define it as judgmental, dis, uh, restrictive, it, or discouraging? It, it fits in between judgmental and restrictive. I see what you're saying now. As I say, I'm a little slow after uh, 3 o'clock. Um, but, but understand, sir, the California Highway Patrol is mainly a freeway function, which is different than surface streets. And I think, this, it, uh, um, I, I think it's important to understand that, that while they certainly need to balance the need to immediately apprehend with the risk, uh, freeways are, in, in many cases, less risky than surface streets. Whereas the Border Patrol is handling all types of... Um, uh, yes, sir, and the balance needs to be the same, but, but certainly when you get on the surface streets or the Florida Highway Patrol, when the car exits the freeway, the risk uh, is, 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 mm -hmm. is monumental. Mr. Bonner, are you familiar with the California Highway Patrol's... Um, High pursuit policy? Only vaguely, sir. I just wondered whether you'd had a chance to to form any opinions about its adequacy, because um, it's my understanding they have a communication requirement in there. What I've for, uh, a quick, um, a cursory reading of it that there is a communications requirement in there. And is it? I guess my and there's a follow-up question: is whether you're opposed to a commun communications requirement uh, exclusive <laughs> entirely, or no? Exactly. Um, what do you? How do you feel about that? I feel that were it not for the communications <coughs> problems, that it would be a very reasonable requirement. However, there are situations when an officer is out of radio contact and has to make these decisions and can't just give up and go home because he can't communicate with somebody. But you, is it the position of your organization? Uh, do you object to provisions of a policy or operating instructions that would require, whenever possible, uh, direct communication with the supervisor? No, not whenever possible, no. Um, Mr. Bubel, do uh, you work the Temecula area? Yes, sir. Do you reside in Temecula? I did until a couple of months ago, yes, sir. I just wondered, uh, you'd heard, I think you heard me ask the mayor about relationships between the Border Patrol and, and uh, the police and the citizens of um, Temecula. I just wondered if you have any observations on that and whether there are ways to improve the communication. Uh, traditionally, there have been very good communications between the Border Patrol and local law enforcement. Um, that included Highway Patrol and the Riverside County Sheriff's when they were the only agencies in the area. Um, like she mentioned, there were times where Border Patrol were the only people that were available, as opposed to having to wait 45 minutes for a Riverside County Sheriff's Office to show up. So the public would call us, or we would get called by the sheriff and asked to go and respond to certain instances. Um, since 1989, when the Temecula PD came on board, there has been both limited contact between them and us, and us and them. And they're fairly new in the area, whereas, whereas we've been there since 1934. And uh, 
It's just that, that that line of communication has never been opened either by our agency or theirs. And we would welcome that line to be opened because we, we definitely get along very well with the Highway Patrol in our area and with the sheriffs that have been in the area for a while. In your opinion, what level does that get opened at? Excuse me? How does that get opened? Uh, 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 I don't know. I, you know is, is it something that the agents themselves should go out and look, look forward themselves or is it something that management should take care of? I believe personally that, it, that it's something that management should look forward to doing, both their management and ours, to foster the, the communications back and forth. And again, we go back to radio contact. Our, our patrol cars have no contact with any other agency. In the area of Temecula, the Highway Patrol has scanners so that when they hear us in a pursuit, they're, they're, they hear it on their scanner and they know what's going down. I don't know whether the Temecula PD has that or not. But, you know, like I said, we would welcome better communication, whether it's radio communications or whether it's, it's interaction between the officers. Now, are you, able, are you able to have radio communications with other INS vehicles? Uh, if you mean other departments of the INS, uh, we do if they have the proper channels in their vehicles. And uh, I'm assuming with this, you can have communication with other Border Patrol vehicles. Yes, we can. Uh, and in certain areas, you can't communicate with anybody. Sure. And there are certain vehicles, because of the, the inferior um, radios that we have, that cannot you know, communicate car to car, but they can communicate car to, to office. So that there are times where even we have to relay through the office to get a hold of another vehicle. Thank you. Mr. McCandless, any? Just a, just a comment. It's my understanding that uh, the Sheriff's Department and the Highway Patrol will have uh, common communication systems by the 1st of November, which certainly is something I think we ought to look at or suggest that the management look at here in terms of, <coughs> of bringing themselves into that net in some form or another. Let me bring up a statement here, something that you know, is, is directly related to the Temecula agents and radio communications. Uh, we have portable walkie-talkies that are programmable so that we have channels or we used to have channels that were open so that we could program in the sheriff's radio program and we could hear them from our walkies in our vehicles so that if we were responding to an incident where they asked for our, our assistance, we could listen on, on our walkie-talkie and hear what they were saying and what was going on. When San Diego Sector heard that we had programmed our radios to the local uh, law enforcement agencies, they removed that from our radios. And they covered all the channels with, with, with San Diego channels, Border Patrol channels only, <coughs> to prevent us from communicating with, with the other agencies. Was there any, ever any explanation given to you for that? No, sir. We were just you know, re told that we will not reprogram the radios and that, that all the channels would be, from now on, filled up. There would be no open channels for us to utilize for other agencies. Oh, does that provide something for you in the way of assistance with all of these other channels that would be uh, equal to having that kind of a channeling of, of local law enforcement? Uh, Any time that we can communicate directly vehicle to vehicle is, is an, as, as an asset to us. Uh, I meant the other, you referred to it as the other San Diego Border Patrol channels. Uh, generally, no. We don't, in the Temecula area, we don't have direct contact with, say, the IB or the Brownfield or or the Chula Vista stations unless we go down there to work, which some of us do occasionally. But other than that, on a day-to-day -day basis, we don't need those other channels in our radio. They're definitely important for the people that are working in the San Diego area, but for those of us in Temecula, we're 80 miles away, we can't contact them on, on our walkie-talkies because they're too small anyway. Um, well, for the benefit of the commissioner, if, you're, if you've ever traveled some of those back roads, they're state highways, incidentally. At midnight or 1 a.m. in the morning, as an individual in a patrol car, uh, the feeling is there, irrespective of what happens or doesn't happen, that you, you're, you're out on the limb and, the, and somebody could saw it off and nobody would ever know. And that's why I'm paranoid over communications and the need to address that issue in this part of, of this high operational area because of the safety of the officers. End of editorial, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the witnesses uh, and there have been some of you, there have been some questions that have been raised that we need to get into, but I, what I'd like to do is submit written questions. Dr. Alfred, uh, I've got some uh, that I'd like to, and I think Mr. McCandless does too. 
Uh, Commissioner, I want to express my appreciation to you and to note that I've uh, chaired the subcommittee now four years, and you're the first uh, person of your rank who sat through the entire hearing, and I appreciate that very much. Uh, uh, the, uh, there are witnesses who came from long distances uh, uh, and are going to be going back long distances. Um, Mr. Bonner, Mr. Rubell, uh, Dr. Albert, you didn't come quite as far, but you made an effort to be here, and of course, the mayor and, and uh, Mr. Patterson, as well as uh, uh, a large number of the Border Patrol. Uh, we, we appreciate the interest that each of you had in this very, very important, important hearing. And, and finally, in closing, I want to thank Mr. McCandless, uh, without whom this hearing would not have happened, and who has been largely responsible for putting it together, both Mr. McCandless and his staff, uh, Ms. Tripp and others. This is an important topic. It is one that uh, Mr. Camp McCandless is, uh, uh, through his efforts, has gotten the subcommittee to uh, devote a considerable effort to. Uh, it will continue to do so. We will keep the record open uh, for a period of time to receive the submissions that some indicated they wanted to make and, and then also some answers to questions. And we will continue to review this. Um, there is an, as many of you have noted, that there is an innate uh, conflict at times, but which we must always seek to, to resolve between the demands of law enforcement and the demands of public safety. And I don't envy an officer who has to make a split-second decision. Uh, and, and, and it seems to me it's a constant evolving process where what you, the decision you make one minute may not be the decision that you, you, you may have to change that decision the next, uh, in the next 30 seconds. Uh, the purpose is not to, of these proceedings is not to um, undermine the efforts of law enforcement, the Border Patrol, the INS, or any other law enforcement agency. Uh, the purpose is to try and see to the extent possible we can resolve that and avoid uh, the kind of tragedies that no one wants to see happen, in which we all suffer as a result. I want to thank everyone for uh, their participation and help uh, in this hearing, and I declare it adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Join us this evening for a speech by President George Bush. We followed Mr. Bush on the campaign trail in Texas as he promoted the proposed superconductor super collider project for Texas. Our coverage gets underway tonight at 8.10 Eastern Time, 5.10 p.m. Pacific Time on C-SPAN. Stay tuned now for more of our schedule. C-SPAN, the cable satellite public affairs network, and its companion network, C-SPAN 2,